Welcome friends to another r slash nuclear revenge video. Today we've got a crazy story of revenge involving a sibling sleeping with their sibling's fiance. But first, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. That said, our story of the day is my brother slept with my fiance, so I ruined his life. No doubt you felt anger before. You stubbed your toe, you lost a bet with a friend, someone cut you off in traffic when you were already having a bad day. Whatever the case, we've all been there before, all experienced that kind of passing frustration. But have you ever felt what I like to call deep anger? You know, the kind of anger that doesn't just leave, the kind that flares up like a normal case of red hots, rising and rising and rising, and then just stays there. The kind of anger that'll sit with you for days and weeks, if not months and years, boiling and simmering with untouchable heat until it can finally be released somehow. The kind of anger that can ruin your life or someone else's. I'm sure some psychiatrist type out there could give me some proper medical term for whatever it is I'm describing, but that's the name I prefer, deep anger. Anyways, if you haven't had the tragic luck of experiencing deep anger before, I pray to God you never do. I wasn't kidding when I said it has the potential to ruin lives, and I'm unfortunately not kidding when I say I know this from my own experience. It all started with my older brother. My brother and I have never had the best of relationships, even before all the stuff I'm about to tell you went down. He was always kind of manipulative and two-faced towards me, in a way I don't know how to describe other than to say he would do something to mistreat me or take advantage of me and then try to convince me that it had been an honest mistake, that it would never happen again. When we were kids, his favorite thing to do would be to convince me to go out in the backyard with him to play a game of two-man baseball. When I would inevitably agree, having somehow forgotten what had happened the last time we played backyard baseball, we would go out there and he'd say something like, All right, OP, you can start out as the batter and I'll be the pitcher, like he was doing me some kind of favor. Then we would both get in our places, he would take the baseball, wind up in some super exaggerated motion, and then BAM! The ball would fly right into me, every single time. The first couple, I'd get some variation of, sorry OP, I'm still warming up. After that, when I started to get mad, it would be, come on, it's harder than it looks. Then, when he could tell that I was finally about to quit and run back inside, he would convince me to try at least one more pitch. Sometimes I would have the sense to refuse, but sometimes, for whatever reason, I would decide to give him another chance. When i do that, my brother would really make me pay for my stupidity. I'd get back in place, ready myself for the pitch, and then BAM! Right in the head, every time. I'm sure you're shaking your head right now at how dumb I was for falling for such an obvious trick. Well, I can't really disagree with that sentiment too much, keep in mind that at this time, I was only 7 or 8 years old. I genuinely looked up to my brother, who was 4 years older than me and I was willing to forgive him every time. He was never worth it though. That's just a small example, kind of a stupid one, but it's just one of thousands that I experienced day in and day out while I was growing up. And eventually, my brother's betrayal and manipulation reached levels that no sane person had any business excusing. Levels that I had no intention of excusing. The first step to getting to this level of betrayal and anger Besides, you know, all the stuff he did on a daily basis growing up came when I was a senior in high school. When I was a senior, I'd gotten a girlfriend who I really liked. In hindsight, it was just a typical high school thing, nothing that serious. But at the time, this girl was basically my life. Bit of an exaggeration, but still, I spent almost every second of free time I had with her and talked about her in front of my family constantly. All that to say, my brother definitely knew what she meant to me and how much I cared about that relationship. Maybe you already see where this is going, but if you don't, let me explain. One day, I'm coming home from school earlier than normal. It's a Thursday, and normally on Thursdays, I have basketball practice for at least an hour and a half, two hours after school. But on this particular day, my practice had been canceled, so I'm getting back to my house earlier than I normally would. I'm excited as I make my way home. My girlfriend's supposed to be waiting there for me, which isn't an unusual thing at all. 
Like I said, we were really close and had been dating for probably like seven months at this point. So my family is very comfortable with her and she more or less can let herself in and out of the house as she pleases. When I get home, I see my girlfriend's car in the driveway like I was expecting. From the rest of the cars there, it looks like both my parents are gone and it's just my brother there along with my girlfriend. Anyway, I walk into the house and start to make my way upstairs to where my room is. I hadn't seen my girlfriend downstairs at all, so I call out her name. No response. Kind of weird, but she probably just didn't hear me. I walk into my bedroom, expecting to see her there, but she's not. Now I'm getting genuinely confused. I'm nearly positive I hadn't seen her anywhere downstairs, and it's not like this is a huge house with places I wouldn't have seen her. I call out her name again, still no answer. Confused, I walk out of my room and start to make my way down the hall to where my brother's room is. Maybe he knows where she is. I open the door to his room and start to ask, Hey, have you seen when I'm stopped in my tracks? Bam! Just like the baseballs he would hurl at my head as a kid, I'm greeted by a sight I can only describe as utter betrayal. There, on my brother's bed, are my brother and my now immediately ex-girlfriend fully going at it. No clothes, no shame, no nothing. As you might imagine, I immediately fly into rage mode. What the freak is going on? What are you doing? I don't even know if I'm talking to my brother or my girlfriend, but I'm talking to someone. Words can't even describe how angry I'm feeling. A few minutes later, after they've both dressed themselves, I obviously break up with my girlfriend on the spot right then and there. She tries to give me some half-hearted excuse, but I cut her off immediately and just send her away. I'm not going to waste my time with any of that. There's no excuse in the world that can convince me to stay with her after what I just saw. So that just left my brother. While I'd been talking with my girlfriend, he had conveniently slipped away and gone back upstairs but I'm not gonna let him get off that easily. I walk back upstairs and head to his room. When I get there, he's just sitting on the edge of his bed, staring at the wall, obviously trying to look as remorseful as possible. I managed to stand there for a second before going right back into anger mode. Well, I basically shouted him, do you even have anything to say for yourself? I mean, what were you thinking? How are you gonna betray my trust like that? You're, wait, my brother interrupts me. Please, just calm down for a second and let me explain. I was, let you explain? Let you explain? What is there even to explain? Just hold on a second, he says. Please, please just calm down and I can explain everything. I'm still fuming, but I take a step back and make a motion with my hands like, go ahead. So he does. My brother proceeds to tell me his account of what happened. A long-winded, rambling story about how he'd been minding his own business in his room when my girlfriend had randomly barged in and started making really aggressive advances towards him. He had obviously tried to reject her advances over and over again, but she was so persistent that he eventually had basically no choice but to get in. And that's how we got here. He finishes telling his story, looking up at me like, I'm just supposed to drop everything now? Live and let live? The story's obviously BS, but I'm honestly just more defeated than angry at this point. The fury is giving way to sadness. Okay, I sigh and just turn around for the door. Wait, my brother jumps up off his bed. Wait, wait, listen, you gotta believe me. I wouldn't do anything to hurt you, I promise. Really? I just stare at him. Honestly, I... Listen, I made an awful mistake, but you gotta forgive me. I'm so sorry. He looks right into my eyes. I will never do anything like this to hurt you again, I swear. Ready to just be done with all of this over the top pleading, I nod. Okay, thanks, I hope you mean that. I do, he says as I walk away. After that day, he more or less stuck to his promise to me, but that didn't exactly entail too much on his part. I was a senior in high school, so only a few months after that day, I was off to college and away from my brother leaving him with remarkably few opportunities to somehow betray me again. For the most part, I loved being at college and away from my brother, not having to constantly worry 24-7 about what he might be doing or how he was going to make my life miserable on a random Thursday was one of the most refreshing experiences of my life. 
When I would go home on breaks and holidays to visit, we would be cordial to each other. No nasty words, no shooting daggers, but it was always still a little bit tense. I never completely lost the feeling in the back of my head that I couldn't trust my brother, that he was still trying to play me or take advantage of me somehow. But for the most part, I just try to suppress that thought. I was away from home, so there was nothing he could do, and he was still family. Yeah, he may have been a jerk to me in the past, but he was still family. Fast forward about four years into the future, I've just graduated from college a few months ago, and I've been dating this girl I met there for quite some time. Looking back, there were more than a few red flags I should have noticed and done something about, but I'm stupid and naive, and at the time, I thought this girl is the one, as in the one, the one. So much so that I actually pulled the trigger and proposed to her after we both graduated from school. She says yes, if only she hadn't. We're so excited, I've never been happier, blah blah blah, the whole deal. So we set a date to get married, about three months into the future. Things are going amazing, I'm enjoying life, and it's just smooth sailing all around. What could go wrong at this point? Well, fast forward about another two months into the future. It's now just about a month before I'm due to get married, and my family decides to take a trip over the Christmas holiday. My parents are paying for the whole thing, so I'm all aboard. We end up going to this super nice resort right on the beach, where we have great weather and a great view of water. It's me, my fiancé, my parents, and my brother, and all in all, we're having a great time. For the first few days, that is. Then I start noticing some weird stuff happening between my fiancé and my brother. Hard to describe stuff, but noticeable nonetheless. Weird looks between them. Sometimes I would walk into a room where they were, and they would sort of jump to attention. Just strange energy between the two of them that starts to get the wheels turning in my head. At first I thought I was just being paranoid. I mean, this is my freaking fiancé for crying out loud. We love each other, right? She would never do something to hurt me. But as the days ticked away on our vacation, and the looks and secretiveness in the weird energy not only continued, but seemed to be increasing, my suspicion got to the point where I wasn't even sure I would call it paranoia anymore. But still, it's not like I had any definite proof of anything. For all I knew, I was just being paranoid, and this whole thing had been completely made up in my head. Then I'd start to think about that day, four years in the past, when I'd come home, only to find my brother and my then-girlfriend. My thoughts continued to bounce back and forth like this, one extreme to another, day after day, until about a week into our vacation. I had had enough. I had to get to the bottom of all this somehow. I decided to lay a trap of sorts. One day, when my parents were planning on going into the local town to do some shopping, I told my fiancé that I was planning on going with them. She asked if I wanted her to go with me. I knew she legitimately wouldn't want to go. For whatever reason, she disliked spending time with my parents. One of those red flags I was talking about earlier. So this was the perfect opportunity to put my little plan into motion. No, I told her, it's fine, I'll just go with them myself. You stay here and rest up. So the three of us left, me, my mom, and my dad, leaving just my fiancé and my brother back at the condo. After about 20 minutes, I lied and told my parents my stomach wasn't feeling well, so I was just going to walk back by myself while they continued to shop. On the walk back to our condo, my heart was pounding, and I actually started to feel a little bit sick to my stomach. If my suspicions were true, and, well... I didn't even want to think about that. I was just being paranoid, and I was going to prove that to myself here and now, and be able to put this awful paranoia to rest. When I got back, I opened the door slowly and quietly creeped into the entranceway. I passed by the living room and didn't see anyone, so I continued past the room towards the hallways where everyone's bedrooms were located. Still walking as silently as I could, I turned the corner into the hallway, and BAM! Final fastball right to the cranium. There were only two people in this condo besides me, and the sounds coming from my brother's room were unmistakable. I wasn't being paranoid. I was immediately furious, of course, 
and I thought about barging into the room to confront them both right there, but for whatever reason, I decided to leave the condo. Somehow I didn't think it would be enough to just confront them. I had entered the purest state of deep anger I'd ever experienced in my life, and I needed actual payback. Not just a little bit of yelling, raised voices, a couple of how could you's. No, I wanted lives ruined, reputations slashed, futures shattered. I wanted actual revenge. I wanted to inflict pain. Remember what I said about deep anger? About how it can stay with you for days or even weeks? Well, I learned that firsthand. For the next two weeks after that day, I stayed as livid as I'd been from the very first moment. But the thing about deep anger is that it's fundamentally tactical. The fury runs so deep that you'll be able to pull off anything, do anything, pretend to be anything, in pursuit of your new mission of pain infliction. So for the next two weeks, although I was absolutely red hot furious to the bone, constantly and 24-7, I never let it show. I had a plan. The first thing I did was break it off with my fiancé. I didn't tell her why, didn't tell her what I discovered during the vacation, just packed up the things she had in my apartment, gave them to her, and kicked her to the curb, left to wonder what had happened. I obviously thought about including her in my plan for revenge, but honestly, the rage I had felt towards my brother completely overshadowed the anger I felt towards her. She had betrayed me, no doubt, but my brother... My brother had sold me out and spit on me, and I was out for blood. To understand the next part of my plan, there's one thing you need to know about my brother that I haven't told you yet, and that's that he's a former drug addict. During my sophomore year in college, he had become seriously addicted to a variety of drugs. I wasn't there for most of it, but from what I understand, it eventually got bad enough that my parents ended up giving him an ultimatum, get clean or get kicked out of the family. So my brother did get clean, got help, went to rehab, did the whole shebang. But as my parents and my brother both told me afterwards, the ultimatum remained. If my brother ever started using again, he would essentially be excommunicated from the family. No chance to explain himself, no wave goodbye, no contact, and he would even have no job because he was employed at the company our dad ran. So as the deep anger worked its way through my system and coursed through my veins, I zeroed in on that beautiful prospect, ruining my brother's life. I didn't think I'd be able to get him using again, and believe me, I would have tried if I thought there was a feasible way, but I did think there was a way that I could make it look like he had started using again. The first thing I did was buy a small amount of a certain drug I knew my brother had had a bit of a lust for in the not-too-distant past. I'm not going to say which one because I'm not sure if that's allowed, but let's just say that it took some dedication for me to find. I didn't care though. I would have gone full Walter White and cooked my own product if I had to. My brother was going down one way or another. The next thing I did was wait for a time when our whole family would be staying together under the same roof. I didn't get my chance until Easter holiday when my brother and I would be staying at my parents' house over the weekend. Again, I didn't care. I would have waited a whole year if I had to. My brother was going down. All that was left then was to put my plan into action. I knew while we were there, my mom would insist on doing my brother and I's laundry. No matter how much I insisted back that I was more than capable of doing my own, and that she usually did laundry on Saturday afternoons. So when noon rolled around on that Saturday, I took the little special baggie I'd purchased for my brother, quickly snuck it into his room while he was preoccupied downstairs, and tucked the bag into the back pocket of some jeans on the top of his laundry basket. After setting the scene, I dashed back out of the room and prepared to wait. When I saw my mom going upstairs with a laundry basket 30 minutes later, I knew the time had almost come. Sure enough, not a full 10 minutes had passed before I heard my mom let out what I can only describe as a truly frightening yell. After the yell, she practically ran down the stairs and into the living room where my brother, my dad, and I were sitting. I noticed immediately she had the present I'd left for my brother in her hands. What the freak is this? She screamed at my brother. You cannot be serious right now. I could see the fear in my brother's face as he sat up in his chair. What the heck? What is that? That's not mine, mom. 
My dad stood up then, walked over to where my mom was standing, and took the bag from her. He examined it for a good second, then looked up at my brother seriously. You're done, son. You're done. What? My brother was losing it. I'm not even lying right now. That's seriously not mine. I'm telling the truth. My mom laughed sarcastically. Oh, you're telling the truth? Isn't that just convenient? Do you know how many times we heard that same story two years ago? We can't believe a word you're saying right now. My brother was basically on his knees now, begging my parents to listen to him. I know, I know, believe me, I know. But you've got to listen to me now. That's actually not mine, I swear. I've been clean for the past two years. You know this. My mom sighed. I thought I did know that. I thought I did. But apparently it was all just another one of your great big lies. No, no, it's not. I don't know where that came from at all. My dad jumped in now. So what, son? You want us to believe that this baggie just magically teleported into your room? That someone snuck in there and planted it on you? I mean, come on now, give us a break. I know you can pull anything over us, but we're not that dumb. He says, but I didn't. Nope, nope, my dad interrupted. This has already gone on long enough. You knew what the deal was. Go upstairs, pack whatever you can into a duffel bag, and get out of here. You're done. He said, no, but I... I'm not going to tell you again. Go upstairs, pack your stuff, and get out. And don't even think about trying to show up to the office on Monday. You're done there too. He says, but dad, I need that job. What am I going to do in the meantime? Where will I even stay? My dad just shrugged. That's for you to figure out. Still in shock, my brother stood up from his chair and slowly made his way upstairs. Like he was being sent to the electric chair or something. I sat where I was, where I'd been the entire time my family was blowing up around me. Slightly shocked myself that the plan had worked so terribly effective. I noticed that my shoulders had unclenched, and that my jaw wasn't as tight as it had been. The deep anger was gone, along with my brother. After about 30 minutes, he came walking back down the stairs with a single duffel bag in hand. He started to walk over to my mom, like he wanted to give her a hug goodbye or something. But she lifted up her hand and pointed towards the door. Dejected, he slowly walked across the rest of the room, made it to the door, opened it, and walked out. That was the last time I ever saw my brother in person. The guilt started to hit me almost as soon as he made his way out of the door. I quickly realized, sitting there in my chair, as my parents silently walked up to their room together, that it wasn't just my brother that I'd punished. I had punished my entire family had, if I was really being honest, torn my entire family apart just then, in the blink of an eye. Yeah, my brother had done some messed up things to me, and he maybe deserved to get some of the payback for all of the stuff he'd put me through, but my parents? I got up too then and made my way to my room. I wasn't angry anymore, just sad. The guilt was pretty bad then, but it was nothing compared to what I felt a month later. I was sitting in my apartment watching TV when I got a call from my mom. I picked up the phone and could tell immediately something was wrong from her voice. When I asked her what was wrong, she told me that she'd gotten a call from my brother earlier that day and that he was still using. She then told me that my brother was still claiming that the baggie they'd found in his room wasn't his, but that, just despite them, he had actually started using again. He's obviously delusional, my mom cried to me. I can't believe he would ruin his life like this. After that, I did my best to comfort her, but what could I say? When I hung up the phone, it all hit me. In the span of a single day, I had started a chain reaction that had led to my brother being kicked out of the family, fired from the only job he ever had, and inspired to start using drugs again. I still don't believe that there's any way he deserved all that. He may have harassed me since I was a kid, had been a key part in ruining two of the most important relationships in my life, but dang. All I know for a fact is that my parents didn't deserve any of this. If I could go back, the one thing I wish I could change for certain is my parents being punished by all of this. They always thought it was my brother and his addiction that was going to tear the family apart. Little did they know, it was going to be me and my anger issues. So in the moment, at the heat of everything, do you blame OP for what they did? 
after all of the childhood bullying and abuse from their brother, after having two of the most important relationships ruined for them like that, in that moment, do you blame OP for planning that stuff on their brother and getting them kicked out? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. That said, our story of the day is my ex-husband embarrassed me, so I made him pay for my wedding. I sat with my legs crossed in the banking hall, smiling brightly at the cashier as the money counting machine did its job. Occasionally, he looked up at me, but whenever our eyes met, he returned his attention uneasily back to the job before him. I couldn't blame him. He was probably not accustomed to having a beautiful customer, wearing red lipstick and a tight dress, smiling so cheerily at him. My outfits made me feel bad to the bone. It was just the dress for the occasion. The young man's unease in my demeanor was understandable too. My smile truly did have a sinister edge. Suddenly, at that moment, I felt on top of the world. For the first time, I was doing things my way. For the first time, I was taking charge. I've never been particularly lucky with love and romantic relationships. Relationships in general, really. Not to sound like a narcissist, but I assure you that the problem is never from me. Fun, I might have a few flaws of my own, but mostly the issue is that I always fall for the wrong people. You'll agree with me when I'm done sharing my story. I must mention though that this is not a cry for pity. Perhaps I craved that at some point in my life, but it's only led me into toxic relationships with me pathetically seeking acceptance. I'm way past all of that now. I had my first crush, or say, my first attempt at love, when I was 12. His name was Jim, and he was the most beautiful boy I had ever seen at the time. He had long blonde hair and fine blue eyes that never looked my way. He lived just down the block, and he was a friend of my brother's, so he came to visit a lot. But every time he came to our house, he went straight to my brother's room for the video games. I was always the one who got the door, and so at first, I used to think he loved coming around for me, but I soon realized that was not the case. The only time Jim and I truly spoke was when I leaked my brother's secret cheat code for a game. My brother was furious with me for a while, but all of that didn't matter. Jim had smiled at me, patted my head, eaten ice cream with me while we waited for my brother to return from an errand. That was compensation enough for me. The very next day, I heard some girls giggling in my class about a rose that Jim had given one of them. I confirmed that it was the same Jim, my Jim. My heart was shattered. In senior high school, I avoided every appearance of romance like a plague. I was not particularly a social butterfly, and neither was I a popular kid. Hence, this was pretty easy for me. My heartbreak had developed into a massive fear of rejection, and I was unwilling to confront it. I did have a very close male friend though. His name was Preston. We were inseparable, and he was the one person with whom I felt the most comfortable. People, including my mom, often said that we would make a good couple, but Preston knew about my disinterest in romantic connections. And so, if at all he liked me, he never expressed it. After high school graduation, Preston and his family moved out of town. His father had gotten a job promotion. The distance took a toll on our friendship and we soon lost touch. In college, I got into several situationships and none of them graduating into serious relationships because, as usual, I was either falling for freak boys or men who were not into commitments. It got to me a lot, but I trained myself to build a thick skin. I told myself it wasn't a big deal, but a part of me sincerely craved true love. I am a beautiful woman. I've always been. So attracting men was not the problem. But for once, I wanted someone to see me for me. It was around this time that I met my ex-husband, Tony. Tony was handsome and popular, so needless to say, he had lots of women on his tail. Naturally, I admired him too, but only from afar. He was way out of my league and the last person I expected to look my way. But it so happened that Tony and I bumped into each other at the counter of a fast food restaurant on a rainy day. My mother was a superstitious woman and she often warned me about omens to watch out for, some of them relating to the weather. Perhaps there'd been one that afternoon, but I hadn't been paying very much attention. What an unexpected change in weather, don't you agree? He'd asked first. I turned slowly to my right where he stood, wondering whether he was truly talking to me. I don't think the forecast mentioned anything about a shower today, he continued, filling up the awkward silence. I know, right? I replied softly. I hadn't checked the weather forecast for that day. I never even took weather forecasts seriously, but it felt like the right thing to say. He sighed deeply in response. 
Anyway, I'm Tony Wells. What's your name? I see you around campus a lot, he said. And that was it. From that moment onwards, Tony and I had gotten closer. I wouldn't say I loved him. Our relationship was built more on fascination and the awe I had for Tony. He was sort of my trophy boyfriend, and he seemed to like me quite a lot. Something I never got to often, so I moved with the flow. Our bond had a lot of opposition, and I often heard rumors about escapades of his from concerned friends left and right, but I couldn't be bothered. It was one of the downsides of having a popular boyfriend, and the only way our relationship could survive was trust. And so I trusted Tony wholeheartedly. I believed every word he said. I considered myself lucky to be loved by someone like him in the first place. So I took in every assurance, hook, line, and sinker. The rest of the world and what they thought didn't matter. All that mattered was us. I worked hard to keep our relationship. Tony graduated college before me and landed a pretty great job. His family was well off too, so he was settled pretty early in life. On the night of my convocation ceremony, Tony proposed to me. Till this day, I wondered why I had allowed myself to be led into this trap. I was young and naive, and there was no obvious reason to say no. Somehow, my eyes were blinded to all the red flags screaming at me. For one, his family treated me as an outcast the first time I met them. Tony had assured me that they would come around, but they never did. Apparently, his mother was the matchmaker sort, and she had prearranged a suitable bride for him. My coming into the picture had ruined a lot of arrangements. Tony's mom and sister never came around. Not at the small private wedding event. Tony had insisted we kept it as small as possible. Where they came wearing long, gloomy faces. Nor after I joined the family officially and tried my very best to impress them every chance I got. The message was clear. I was not accepted in their world. Tony took this in the same light and nonchalant way he took everything else. Babe, don't you think you're overthinking this? He would say. After the honeymoon, I barely saw very much of Tony. His job was very demanding, or so he made me believe, and he was out on business trips a lot. I spent a lot of time in our mini mansion alone with the servants. Tony wouldn't let me get a job either. We were doing very well financially. What he lacked in presence, he covered for in finances. Babe, you don't need a job. Why stress? My money's yours to spend. He said the few times casually I brought up the job topic. I did agree. If it were for money reasons, I didn't need a job. But for me, it was more than that. Nevertheless, try as I might, I couldn't get Tony to see the reason behind my line of thoughts. I could not go ahead to do as I pleased either for the fear that he would find out. Again, I was too young, too stupid. I felt trapped, as though I lacked a mind of my own. I lived a somewhat lonely life and I missed my husband. But I couldn't be too demanding, he had to keep working for his family anyway. I wanted to have a baby, but that was barely even possible with Tony being away most of the time. It got so bad that he was absent even for Christmas in our first year of marriage. Then he started to get distant. At first I thought I was overreacting. I didn't want to be a nagging wife, but I could not be suffering in silence. So I confronted him about his emotional absence even when he was around. With his sugar-coated words and actions, he pulled me into an embrace and told me that it was just work stress getting to him. As usual, he calmly told me amidst his soft, rich laughter to stop overthinking irrelevant things. Because I had quite a lot of time and money on my hands, I went shopping a lot. Most of the clothes and jewelry I never wore, but I kept buying them all the same. Money is for spending after all, isn't it? On one of my grocery shopping sprees, I met someone I most definitely did not expect to see again. Preston? I called out to the tall man picking out dairy milk from a shelf. He was slimmer and more muscular than I remembered, but that side view was unmistakable. I could recognize Preston even if he tanned a lot more. The man turned my way in response to my call, and I chuckled in excitement. I was right. Jesus, Preston, I cried in happiness as we locked up in a warm embrace. He recognized me right away. Darn, how many years has it been, he asked cheerfully as we caught up on the good old times on our way out of the mall. Long, too long. I'm so happy to see you. To think that we followed each other on social media and yet we don't keep in touch, I laughed. Right? Everyone's been busy, I guess, he replies, still wearing his killer smile. I mean, look at you, you're married. 
I looked down at the ring in my finger, and my stomach sank at the remembrance. Yes, I truly was married. I had forgotten. Yeah, I plastered on a fake smile. What about you? Who's the lucky woman? Well, there's none yet, he replied, and a brief moment of awkward silence passed. Hopefully we'll be getting to see a lot more people at the reunion, Preston broke the silence. That was when I remembered. My high school reunion was holding the following week. My high school was about a 20 minute drive from the part of town where Tony and I live. I'd seen the reunion invite somewhere in my mailbox before, but I didn't particularly pay attention to it before Preston mentioned it. Yes, the reunion, yes, yes, is that what you're in town for? I asked. He said, yeah, partly. We'd gotten to the car park, and we now had to go our separate ways. I didn't want to leave. Preston was my first real companion in a few days. I'd laughed genuinely for the first time in a while, too, but I didn't want to sound unhappy. Well, well, it was so nice to see you again, Preston. Perhaps I could treat you to lunch sometime while I'm still in town. If you don't mind, that is, he said. His gaze subconsciously shifted to my ring finger. No, not at all. I'll let you know whenever I'm free, I reply, borrowing my fake smile again. We exchanged contacts and went our separate ways. I got home to find that Tony had returned from his trip. It was like that with him. He left and returned whenever he wished. He never saw any need to inform me in advance. Whenever he was home, he was home, and whenever he wasn't, he wasn't. But I was happy to have him back. So happy that after he gave his brief, usual, fine, to the question of how his trip was, I filled him in on everything I'd done all the while that he was away to the last detail of how I met Preston again. That seemed to grab his attention more, seeing as his countenance changed, but he didn't give any comment. I asked if he'd be able to accompany me to my reunion dinner the next weekend, although I doubted that he would. To my surprise, Tony agreed almost immediately. The thought of the possibility that my darling Tony could have been even slightly jealous of my old friend made me smile a little. That afternoon, while he went into the bathroom to freshen up, Tony left his phone lying around unlocked for the first time. That was another thing that changed since we got married. It was an unwritten rule that Tony's phones were out of bounds for me. He could ask to use my phone anytime, but the same could not be applied to me. Whenever I asked, he would ramble on and on about confidential work documents and, so safe to say, my curiosity was piqued at the sight of his phone right there on the bed, open to my infinite possibilities of actions. I wasn't searching for anything in particular. I didn't have any weird suspicions that needed to be clarified either. I just wanted to know how it must feel to snoop around on my partner's phone. The idea of breaking an unspoken rule excited me, so I threw all care to the wind and scrolled through the phone. A few minutes in, my jaw dropped. The gallery was filled with pictures of different women in a different hotel room in a very compromising positions. I wondered what these pictures were doing on Tony's phone, but I soon found, after I braced myself enough to check his social media messaging apps, that while I thought I had seen enough on my ex-husband's phone to unnerve me, there was more. It was clear Tony was cheating on me. And it wasn't just one woman. There appeared to be a number of them. The search result of my name in his chats led me to tidbits of various conversations where I had popped up. In all of them, I was referred to or described with derogatory words either by Tony himself, his friends, his sister, or one of his many mistresses. I felt disgraced. It finally dawned on me why Tony always went on so many business trips. To him, I was a mere decoration while he went out to live his real life. It was a very hard pill to swallow. I felt bile rise in my throat as I tried to hold back tears. I put the phone aside, unable to delve deeper for the sake of my mental health. I couldn't believe it. I had been the perfect housewife. I did everything Tony ever asked of me. Where did I go wrong? I couldn't keep it to myself. I needed to ask Tony the many questions running through my mind. As soon as he walked out of the bathroom, looking hot as usual, I hit him with a question. Who is Tiffany? I asked up front. I wasn't scared of the confrontation. I just needed answers and closure. I expected different responses, remorse, cajoling, or the usual nonchalant type. What I did not expect was anger. His eyes grew darker and flared up with rage as soon as he heard my question. 
His gaze moved quickly from me, standing in front of the large dressing table with my arms folded across my chest, to the bed where his phone lay, now locked. Did you snoop through my phone? He asked coolly. Too coolly. It was chilling. But I was not going to let him demoralize me. I didn't give a reply. He picked up his phone without saying another word, and he walked out of the room. I followed after him. Answer me, Tony. Who are those women? Who are all those women? Is that all you used to go do every time you claimed to have a business trip? I felt myself about to choke on my own voice. It started to feel like everything was a lie, and I wondered just what else he was lying to me about. You dastardly liar. I bellowed when he still wouldn't stop to give me a reply. That seemed to have the desired effect. Tony stopped in his tracks and faced me. What? His eyes narrowed. I had never seen Tony look that creepy before. You had the guts to pick up my phone, my personal property, you went spying through it against my permission, which is stealing by the way, and I'm the shameful one? Do you think I'm oblivious to all of your escapades with your old friend from high school too? I saw the way your eyes glimmered when you mentioned his name. You can't fool me, but somehow you think you're the saint? Tony scoffed sarcastically and continued on his way to the guest bedroom downstairs. The accusations he had hurled at me left me transfixed on the spot. I could not believe that my husband, whom I adored so much, could say all those hurtful words to me. Tony had broken my heart. That day, I felt my home crumble before my eyes like an unstable deck of cards. I started to see all the flaws and faults that I'd allowed myself to be blinded to all the while. I realized that I'd been stupid all along. That night, I cried myself to sleep. The days that followed were sad, long, and uneventful. Tony remained in town, but we were barely speaking, and he maintained the guest room as his new bedroom. The only highlights that I had in that period were the few meetings I had with Preston. I could take my thoughts off my pathetic marriage for a while and truly feel happy. The night of my reunion dinner came, and despite that Tony and I were not on perfect terms, He had agreed to come with me, so we had to show up at the event together. The evening started well and Tony cooperated properly, as I introduced him to some of my old friends. We managed to put up the front of the perfect couple. Until Preston walked up to our cocktail table, he came in good spirits, excited to be meeting Tony finally, but Tony did not reciprocate the energy. He was cold and he made it too obvious. Feeling awkward and uncomfortable, and I couldn't blame him in the slightest, Preston left us in a hurry after the introductions. I pulled Tony aside after that to plead with him to get into character, at least for the night. I could not afford for my husband to embarrass me, not when there were so many people around. He seemed to get the message, and being the freak about his public image, he put up a great front for a good while, but it did not last long. Preston had to leave the event midway, and he came over to bid me farewell. He made a small inside joke about a classmate on the stage and I giggled softly. He said his goodbyes to Tony afterwards and gave me a hug. That was the turning point of my night. In the few seconds that Preston and I held an embrace for, Tony's insecurities surged into his head and in a flash he balled his hand into a fist, pulled me away from Preston and punched my dear friend right in the face. I gasped and the entire crowd turned to look at us almost immediately. Leave my wife alone, Tony growled at Preston, who looked confused as ever. I wanted the ground to open up and take me in it, but that didn't happen. After that night, I was certain that we were the talk of the crowd and I hated it. I hated embarrassing scenes more than anything in my life. Tony did not apologize. Not that night and not the next morning when he left again on another trip. I made up my mind that I was not going to be in that house when he returned. I called Preston to apologize for my husband's rash behavior, and he seemed understanding. I moved my stuff later that day to a part of town where I was certain Tony would not easily find me. Later that week, I sent him copies of our divorce papers. I had had enough. Whether it was because he didn't take me seriously as usual, or because he thought I would come running back to him soon, I'm not sure, but Tony took his time with signing the papers. I couldn't care very much though, as long as I didn't have to see his disgusting self every day, I was fine. Preston and I met up again and hung out a lot. We finally decided to give love a real chance between us. It was easy to love Preston and be loved by him, it was as though we were made for each other. I felt valued and for the first time, 
I was truly in love, and even my instincts agreed that I'd made the right choice. Soon, a wedding was in view, but we couldn't do too much until Tony responded to the divorce papers. I was prepared to force him if I had to. I wanted a real wedding this time, a big and lavish one, and while Preston was certainly doing well for himself, he wasn't as wealthy as Tony, not that I cared very much anyway, but I really wanted a grand wedding. One morning, I woke up to a realization. Tony and I had a joint account as a couple. We had separate accounts too, but the joint account held our fallback funds. Since we weren't officially divorced and I was still a signatory to the account, I decided to pay a visit to the bank. I sat with my legs crossed and my heart swelling as the cashier packed my withdrawn cash into bags. It was approximately all of the account's content, but considering Tony's wealth, I cleared it all. My insides leapt with joy as the young man handed me my bag, flashed a bright smile, and said, thank you for banking with us. I walked out of the bank feeling like I was walking on the clouds. No doubt I'd made a lot of dumb decisions in my life, but I felt I was finally righting all the wrongs. After all, since Tony was still my husband on paper, his money was mine to spend, wasn't it? I chuckled all the way happily to my car. Payback feels good. Do you guys think that OP should feel in the least bit guilty about emptying that wealthy bank account and taking it all for herself? Or do you guys think considering all that OP went through for all those years, that it's the least they deserve on their route to happiness? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. That said, our story of the day is I sent my own mom to prison. My sixth birthday was somehow the best and worst day of my life. It was 1985. Birthdays were one of the few okay days for me and my little sister growing up. Dad usually risked my mom's wrath, gently and cleverly persuading her that a birthday party would make us look good, and that would usually get her begrudging approval. Mom was obsessed with her image. The parties themselves were never anything fancy, a bit of cake, musical chairs, and a few balloons, but it was enough. It was nice to just have a day where tension wasn't constantly simmering at home. My sixth started off on a really good note. Most of my dad's family, i.e. the nice ones, had managed to come. As for mom's side, the ones I didn't like much, either hadn't bothered, were ill, or were busy. I didn't get off scot-free though. I remember cringing when I heard grouchy old Uncle Arnie's stick rapping on the front door. God, that guy can make a clown convention feel like a funeral. Despite that, the party went pretty well, leading up to the arrival of the birthday cake. My mom set it down on the coffee table, next to the ashtray, whilst everyone finished singing the famous song, the one I can't even bear to hear anymore. What happened next was one of those surreal moments that you never want to believe, but have to because you can't run away from the truth. I sucked in all the air that my little lungs could carry and blew them out. Well, it took a couple more goes, but I got there in the end. Then, and it couldn't have been more than a minute later, my dad collapsed, his head hitting our old armchair as he went. Everyone turned, but for that first moment, nobody did anything. I think they expected him to jump right up again and say, gotcha, knowing he liked to play the fool. When it dawned on them that he'd really gone down, the adults first start scrambling around, his sister, my Aunt Rose, making a beeline for the phone. My first instinct, despite everything, was to look to mom. I saw her, arms crossed, watching from behind the island of the open plan kitchen. There wasn't a lick of emotion on her face. Dad had suffered a heart attack. He died on his way to the hospital, leaving me and my little sister with mom. In that brief moment, me and my sis had not lost only our provider, but our shield. I thought it was my fault. I thought that when I'd snuffed out the candles, I'd somehow cursed him by accident. The seeds of guilt had been planted, and every time afterward that my mom said, This is your fault. It only made me more certain that I'd really done wrong. After the funeral, you'd scarcely have known that she'd lost a husband. The biggest change to her was that our family's tight budget had been reduced even further. The lack of money, the struggle for it, only made mom testier than ever. To her credit, and as much as I hate to say it, she did do whatever she could to earn a living. A bit of cleaning work here, a bit of bar work there. She could keep the holes plugged at least as quick as they appeared. The one thing she couldn't stop was her temper. Dad had been on the receiving end in life, both for himself and for us, but now that he was gone, there was nobody. 
If she was ever intending to lose her temper at me or my little sister, it was up to me now to take the consequences. I remember when I was about 12 and my sister would have been about 5. We'd been left alone whilst she was out on a cleaning job. It was late in the evening and we'd had dinner before she left, but it didn't amount to much. A couple hours later, and my sister was grabbing at my arm, crying for something more to eat. I chewed over the idea of breaking mom's rule, don't touch the food. As we both got hungrier though, I decided to give in and go hunting for something we could eat. I wasn't expecting much, but seeing the bare cupboards and bare fridge surprised me nonetheless. I leaned on the counter and wondered what to do. Out of the corner of my eye, I lit up as I saw our pathetic holy grail, the bread box. I pulled the cover up and found two slices of bread in their plastic wrapping. Success! There was a little butter left and some raspberry jelly, so I spread us each a piece and then we just sat on the sofa eating our snack. When mom got home though, a small bag of groceries in tow, there was heck to pay. She opened the fridge and she'd just put away the eggs when she noticed the butter was missing. I was reading a book about Stanley Kubrick, or at least half reading, when she turned to look in the bin. She pulled out a wrapper and asked, what's this? Part of me wanted to give the obvious reply, but I knew better than to rock the boat any more than necessary. I told her that me and my sister were hungry, so I made something to tie us over. My answer didn't cut it for her. She came storming over and started giving the third degree with a nasty look in her eyes, like I was some pervert caught in a devious act. In hindsight, I realized that it was about power. Mom had her rules for a reason. She wanted nothing less than full control. My disobeying her, in her eyes, was a lapse in control. When she didn't get the answer she wanted, I was left with another stinging cheek. I'd become somewhat numb to her outbursts by this point. Don't get me wrong, it still hurt, and I still felt betrayed, but it had almost become routine. My primary worry was my sister. For the time being, mom hadn't touched her. She had shouted at her, which was bad enough, but she'd never crossed the line any further. Still, the worry that she would never left me. It was always in the back of my mind, keeping me on my toes. Recently, though, I'd almost started to discount the possibility, letting it slip out of mind slightly, but here, I'd accidentally dropped my sister in it. As far as my mom was concerned, she was a co-conspirator. She was guilty. I never regretted anything more than implicating my sister. As soon as she was finished with me, she went into the dining room where my sister was drawing. I only anticipated that at most there would be shouting, and that's what there was. I could hear her giving the same verbal lashing that she'd given me, except that's all I could hear. There were no crying or pleas, just mom's voice getting louder and angrier, bursting out of control. Then I heard a muffled smack. Crying followed. The shouting continued. I heard the smack again and again. My blood ran cold. I was paralyzed, my mind running in a hamster wheel. What was I doing? Why couldn't I move? I can't believe I'm being so weak. I'm meant to protect her. These thoughts just kept spinning in my head on a loop. My sister's cries were getting louder and louder. I needed to move, to do something. No matter how hard I tried though, I couldn't get up. But I couldn't continue to hear the repeated smacks, the cries. Reflexively, I covered my ears with my hands, but it did little to drown out the sound. Again and again, smack, smack, smack. Panic and desperation were swelling within me. Please stop, stop. The words spluttered out of my mouth almost automatically. Then for an eerie moment, the shouting, the crying and the smacking came to an abrupt halt, silence. I didn't let my guard down though, as I could feel something hanging in the air. Mom came back into the room with a face like thunder and was about to say something when there was a knock at the door. She brushed herself down and steadied herself, welding a smile onto her face before going to open it. It was Mrs. Kowalski from next door, coming over to see if we were all okay. She found her way inside and looked around before I caught her eye, pointing at me and mumbling questions to Mom. I felt so embarrassed. As slick as ever though, Mom charmed her into peace of mind and she was soon on her way. Mom's skill to enchant people around was unbelievable both for her skill and the contrast of its warmth compared to the real her, the one keeping us locked up at home. 
It meant that the only time I tried to tell someone about what she was doing to us, it achieved nothing. They refused to believe it of her, but my complaints down to childish exaggeration. The despair and dread I felt following that was in like nothing a child should know. Nothing I had known. Until now. As much as I feared for my sister, I never anticipated just how it would feel for her to be on the receiving end. Never again. On the following Monday, it was back to school. I stayed late on Mondays. I went to film club after school. A small group of us tucked away in a glorified closet. One that smelt of cigarettes because the older kids used it as a smoking room. Currently, we were working on creating our amateur short films. The beauty of everyday life was the theme. We had to take it in turns because there was only one VHS camcorder to go around. When we'd all finished making our little films, we'd be putting on an exhibition in the school hall. My turn was next. I lugged the big black camera home with me, walking the dimly lit streets on my lonesome, wondering what I'd film as I headed home. When I got back, I slipped in quietly and snuck upstairs with my bulky friend, taking it to my bedroom and setting it down on the bed. For a moment, I sat with it and looked out the window, looking at the night sky. There was a crescent moon. I thought about taking it into town at the weekend, finding some beauty in our ramshackle run-down town. My mind latched onto the word run-down. Dirt. Darkness. Beauty. Then I thought of a book on my table. I got up, went over to it, and picked it up. Edgar Allan Poe. I flipped through it until I found the story I was looking for. The darkness, the guilt, the truth that can't be escaped. At that moment, I knew what I must do. I turned back to look at the camcorder on my bed. The sight of it made a violent storm of anger and resentment swell within me. My heart beat faster and harder the longer I stared at it. Yeah, I knew what I must do. I waited until my sister went to bed and my mom went to the bathroom. I hurried down the stairs as quietly as I could, camcorder in hand. I went to the living room and tucked the camcorder between the TV stand and the big leafy plant nearby, doing my darndest to make it as inconspicuous as possible. Then, before she came down, I raced over to the cabinet on the other side and pulled out the special bottle of vodka. I remember Aunt May saying that vodka had no flavor, so it was perfect for slipping into Mom's cranberry juice. I put in as much as I could without it looking obvious before screwing the top back on and heading back for the cabinet. I could hear mom coming down the stairs as I gently placed it back on its shelf and closing the door. Then as she entered the room, I jumped down onto the nearest chair and slumped. You treat my furniture with respect, is that clear? This was it. This was the beginning. I shrugged my shoulders at her, my heart racing. She didn't follow up though. Instead, she got cozy on the sofa and took a sip of her juice. I decided that it would be best if she drank the whole lot before I went any further. Dallas and the news finished. She finally took the last sip of her drink. Showtime. Being a kid, I wasn't exactly full of scathing, witty remarks, so I told her, You ought to get a bath because you stink. She laughed. The cutting sound of her laughter incensed me. I got up grabbed her empty glass and threw it at the wall. She stopped laughing. Fueled by anger, I dared to turn my head and meet her gaze. For a moment, she looked like a deer in the headlights, but then her face contorted into piercing indignation. I kept looking at her, but it was as if she was sucking the anger out of me and making it her own. Suddenly, I felt vulnerable and exposed. She briskly got out of her chair and came over to me, leaning forward until her face was almost touching mine. What do you think you're doing? She said in a low and menacing tone. I had a split second to decide whether or not to go the whole way, but I thought of my sister and of protecting her. Go to heck, you ugly witch. I'll be honest, I don't remember much after the first hit. All I know is that I woke up on the floor sore and aching. When I stumbled to the bathroom, I found out that I had a black eye too. I looked at the time on my watch, it was 5 a.m. I got cleaned up as discreetly as possible, dressed for school, and then crept down the stairs and grabbed the camcorder. I hung around until school opened and then headed straight for the film club room, took the video out of the camcorder and put it near the bottom of the pile of tapes in the cupboard where the films were kept. For the rest of the day, I went about as normal and pretended my black eye was the result of a fight with another kid. By the time I got home, I found mom sitting on the edge of the sofa facing me. 
Her expression was stern, but there was a glint in her eyes. About what happened last night, she started. I don't need to make any explanations for my actions. I am your mother after all, but I will concede that perhaps things went a bit far. What I saw in her eyes, I could hear in her voice. A small part of me wanted to believe that it was a kernel of softness, of regret, of love. For my sister though, I remained determined. I simply nodded and went to my room. I sat on the bed for a while, silent and zen-like. What if she'd just shown some inkling of remorse? There was still time to stop. On balance though, I decided that she didn't have limits, that I couldn't take a chance. It would be three long, arduous weeks before the evening of the exhibition. In that time, I kept a low profile, but stuck close to my sister to make sure she was safe. When that Friday evening arrived, mom had us all make an extra effort. There was going to be a number of parents and local folk turning up, so she was determined to make a good impression. We got in the car, and within 15 minutes, we were bathed in the halogen glow of the school's lights. We headed for the auditorium, and mom started mingling with the other adults whilst I went to fetch my film. Walking the empty halls was an eerie thing. The silence seemed to amplify everything. The lights, the polished floor, and even the dull beige-gray lockers that flanked me. It was a deathly ominous moment. Finally, I arrived at the door of our little club room. I grasped the cold metal handle, took a breath, and gave it a sharp push. I was invited into the darkness by the familiar fading scent of Laramie's, fumbling around for the light switch before flicking it on and walking over to the cupboard. I brushed its chipped top with my hand and gave the whole idea one more consideration. I could still back out. This was my last chance. I'd pay heck for it if I did. No, I've started it. I must finish it. I swung open the cupboard and grabbed the videotape from its home. The feel of it stirred something within me, something resembling excitement. Fear? No. It was anticipation. I walked back into the auditorium, just as everyone was settling into their seats. Mom smiling and beckoning me. The sight of her smiling at me made me feel sick to my stomach, but I couldn't work out whether it was guilt or repulsion. Either way, I bared it. I sat next to her and listened as Mr. Robards, the art teacher, welcomed us and set out the order of play. First up was Jackie. She went up to the stage to introduce herself and talk a bit about her film, before handing it over to be played. Hers was a nature film, shot at a wildlife reserve a few miles out of town. All things said, it was actually pretty good. I only wish I could have enjoyed it. Next was Tommy, who filmed himself and his friends doing funny stuff, highlighting the beauty and shared laughter. There was still yet one before me, Lisa. She went onto the stage to do her intro, handed her tape over, and just as she foretold, her video was about finding beauty in grim things. She must have read my mind. She'd picked out on one of the most run-down shopping areas and a decaying mansion, presenting them, in fairness, better than I could have done. In such a tense situation, it seemed absurd to feel a pinch of relief over not having to directly compete with her. After she finished, Mr. Robards called me onto the stage. My heartbeat picked up and my hands were starting to get balmy. Slowly, with my heart in my throat, I got up and walked out towards the stage. Everything felt like a blur, and of all the things I could think of, my first thought was, I'm sorry that this will probably ruin Jackson's turn. I walked up the steps, across the stage, and stood behind the wooden podium, clueless as to what to say. I decided to follow my heart. Hello, my name is Jack. Tonight, I want to share a different kind of beauty that I've discovered. It's the beauty of freedom, of truth, and justice. This was a hard-won appreciation, and one that I want to share with everyone. Thank you for listening. My voice quivered a bit and my heart was beating like a drum, but I'd managed it. Mr. Robards came over and held out his hand, and after a pause, shaking, I managed to give him the tape. I followed him to the side of the stage, my eyes welling up slightly, and stood, watching as he fed the tape into the slot. Smoothly, quickly, it disappeared into the abyss and left my control once and for all. I turned my head to the projector screen as he hit play, and from behind the comfort of the curtain watched. In glorious technicolor, our beige and brown living room appeared on the big screen. 
In the center was me and mom, capturing the moment right after I told her to go to heck. There, in front of a whole crowd, a crowd of fellow parents, neighbors, and well-wishers, my mother watched with them as her earlier self messed me up bad. The reaction wasn't like in the cheesy movies when everybody gasps in unison. No, it was more like a steadily growing collection of whispers and noises. I'd edited the tape to finish right after she left me lying on the floor, making it by far the shortest of the films. After it finished, Mr. Robards looked at me aghast and was about to say something when there was a blood-curdling scream from the audience. It was hers, mother's voice. You rat, she shouted. I peeped around the corner of the curtain and saw her standing in her violet dress with a deranged, hungry expression on her face. It hadn't been remorse after all. She caught sight of me and went to move, but the crowd intervened, and Mr. Robard stepped in front of me. Even as one of the fellow mothers and two men blockaded her, she struggled like a wild animal. Mr. Robards conveyed a message to the women up front through a series of gestures before leading me to an empty classroom. He beckoned me to sit and took a seat opposite me. He said, I'd heard that you got that shiner from being in a fight with another boy. I nodded. He says, but that wasn't true, was it? I shook my head. He says, how long has this been going on? I say, ever since I can remember. He sat back in his chair and looked down. You have a younger sister, don't you? I nodded again, and he said, has she? Tears just burst out of me. Once they started, I couldn't stop them. I just cried and cried. Mr. Robards came over and gave me a hug. The sound of approaching police sirens in the distance. Once they arrived and I'd settled down, a female officer came and sat with me. She was very understanding and asked me about life with my mother as sensitively as possible, about the tape and other incidents that I could remember. My mother was arrested. In the meantime, me and my sister were uprooted and moved 200 miles east to live with Aunt Jane, my dad's sister, her husband, and their kid. They lived on a farm just a few short miles from the nearest town, and boy, it was some farm. Lots of trees, a little creek, and green as far as the eye could see. Aunt Jane and Uncle Bill welcomed us almost as warmly as their sheepdog Shep. The house was more rustic than ours, but nicer with it. Homely, it wasn't just the decor either. It was the atmosphere. There was a warm, inviting feel to the place. I put it down to the kindness and love that existed between its inhabitants. It gave a light to the place that, as the cliche goes, makes a house a home. It was some time before the case got to court, and I never saw any of the trial. It had been decided that my testimony wasn't necessary, given the smoking gun evidence that they had. When the verdict reached me, I relaxed for what felt like the first time in my life. Guilty. 15 years. I'd sent my own mother to prison, and you know what? I didn't feel the least bit bad for her. Me and my sister settled into our new home, way of life and discovered the meaning of happiness and peace of mind. We went to new schools, made new friends, and had new experiences. I worked hard at school, got the best grades I could manage, and then went on to college. Now I've got a job in film industry and continue to work towards my dream of making films someday. My sister decided college wasn't for her and dove into the world of business. It took time, but now she's doing well, running her own boutique. Fortunately for her more than me, the memories of the past seem remote and didn't impinge on her as much as me. As for our mother, I got wind of her being released a couple of years early. She must have given the parole board a sweeping with her charm because I can't see why else they'd want to let someone like that out at all, let alone early. Apparently she'd slumped into alcoholism, living life night by night, throwing herself at men in seedy bars in order to get a warm bed. A couple more shorter stints in prison punctuated her new life as a lady of leisure. One for drug running and another for assaulting a police officer. Old habits die hard, I guess. A part of me says I should feel bad for her, but I can't find it within me. Perhaps a better man could, but I'm not him. To be brutally honest, there's a slither of joy in my heart. A sense that justice has been served. Karma. Kismet. Whatever you want to call it. That feeling is only galvanized since becoming a parent myself. The joy and boundless love that I felt as soon as I laid eyes on my newborn son, I knew that I could never hurt him. 
If anything, it only left me more bewildered at how my mother could do it to us. I guess there was just an evil in her heart. I know that my sister still thinks about getting in touch, but I've advised her against it. I told her that it would open a can of worms that ought to stay shut. Time in her young age takes the edge off her memories of her, and she's got a fine heart, but she still lets it take her away at times. She wants to believe that her mother wasn't as bad as all that. I think she trusts my judgment though. She knows I wouldn't be so sure unless I had reasons to be so. And so we've stayed well away from her, leading good and fulfilling lives. That day my father died, I lost the man I loved and respected the most. It was the worst day. In that moment though, I also lost the only reason to stick around. A new possibility to escape was created. It was the best day. Honestly, it's such a disheartening thing to hear about OP's experience and how, at one point, OP mentioned that they tried to admit to somebody what was going on behind closed doors and they weren't even believed because their mom is just such a charismatic person. It's just crazy that OP had to feel obligated to go all the way to showing a graphic video in front of everybody at a film debut to finally get the truth out there. Considering everything the mom did and what ended up happening to the mom after the truth was out there, do you feel like justice was truly served? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Evil Stepfather When I was 15, my mom started dating a man she met on a dating website. I didn't like him the first time I met him, and two months later, he moved into the house. About three weeks after he moved in, he took my skateboards, self-built halfpipe, ramps, BMX bike, ice hockey gear, and many other things to the dump one day when I was at school. He said he did this because he didn't want all of my crap cluttering up his garage. Maybe two months later, he punched me in the stomach for the first time because I got up from the dinner table without asking to be excused. From there, it's collated into full-fledged beatdowns for the smallest perceived slight to his authority. One day, he decided to take my extensive Pokemon card collection, even more extensive comic book collection, my Game Boy and PS2 with all the assorted games, and my fantasy and sci-fi book collection, and got rid of it because 15-year-old boys should be playing football and baseball not being an F-word or a nerd, playing with Pokemon cards and reading comics and books. I would like to add that he was a middle school teacher and in his off time refereed and umpired local middle and high school sports games. My mom never intervened and in fact acquiesced when he demanded that she stop giving me lunch money because the little crap will just spend it on comics and other gay stuff. One day, I took maybe $3 in change out of his change jar so that I can buy a slice of pizza and some fruit during lunch at school, because I was tired of being hungry. My twin sister was always a bit of a jerk, and frequently blackmailed me into doing her chores from a young age. I was fed up and refused to do something, so she told him what I had done. This man actually called the police and pressed a larceny charge against me, and once the police had left, beat me senseless. At that point, I ran away. When the cops found me and returned me to my home, I found out that he'd been trying to talk my mom into sending me away to military school or something of that nature. I ran away again, and between having run away several times and the larceny charge, ended up turning 16 in juvenile detention. I spent the next couple of years miserable and afraid, frequently contemplating ending things. Once I left home, I didn't speak to my mom for several years. We eventually reconciled, and by that point, they had married. I was a lot bigger than I'd been as a young teenager, and had gotten into weightlifting, so he no longer acted like he was going to punch me to make me flinch, much less actually hit me, and we basically avoided each other for the most part. My mother found out that she had stage 4 cancer, and no longer wanted to waste any of the time she had left with him, so she had a lawyer draft up a separation agreement whereby he would receive a set amount of money upon separation and would have 45 days to retrieve his belongings from the house. He had spent his entire inheritance in six months, and then they had to sell his mother's house that he grew up in in order to settle his debts shortly before they started dating. Oh, and my mother bought the house back from the bank before they married. She allowed him to keep the house, and he moved back into his mother's house. My mother passed away about nine months after their separation, and despite the agreement, had been allowing him to come and get his stuff piecemeal. I put an immediate end to that. I sold his baseball card collection, around $14,000, 
and his autograph sports memorabilia, roughly $11,000, and also sold all of his woodworking equipment along with several finished pieces of furniture that he had made. $6,500, I think. I kept his mother's engagement ring, platinum band, three diamonds, roughly two carats, wedding band, his coin collection, I also collect coins, and some tools and other odds and ends. Around a month ago, I ran into him at the grocery store. I told him what I'd done as he was punching his card out towards his car and he took a swing at me multiple times. Several of these punches missed and the ones that did connect, they didn't have much effect because he's nowhere near as strong as he was 20 years ago in his 40s and I no longer a skinny little 15 year old. He continued to try to punch me as I called 911 and was actively ramming his grocery cart into my new Toyota as the police officers pulled into the parking lot. He was arrested for assault, communicating threats, and destruction of property. As a result, he lost his job and pension at the local middle school. And because he never learned how to save money while married to my somewhat wealthy mother, ended up having to sell his mother's house because he hired an expensive lawyer thinking he could somehow beat the charges. My nephew, who was on the football team, made it well known to his friends that he not only had just been arrested and convicted of assault as well as other charges, but that he'd also beat me as a child, causing several parents to call for him to resign from refereeing and umpiring for local sports games. My niece and my girlfriend's much younger sister are enrolled at the middle school where he worked, and say that not only was he universally disliked, but when he came up to the school to get his belongings, He made a big scene and ended up hysterically crying as he was leaving. At least that's what they've heard from the kids who were attending summer school at the time. His son, who he was equally abusive towards a child too, refused to take him in or help him out. So he ended up having to take a job as a cashier at Walmart so that he could afford the rent on his crappy little trailer in an absolutely awful neighborhood. Even though that Walmart is not the closest Walmart to my house, that's now the only place where I go grocery shopping or to purchase anything that I need. I purposely stand in line longer than I need just so that he can be the one who has the pleasure of ringing up my purchases. The first time I went through his line, he attempted to ring up multiple items more than one time to overcharge me, and when I called him on it, said that I was mistaken. I asked for a manager, and the manager believed him that it was an accident but he learned that he can't get away with that. The second time, I made sure to be as nice as possible and had to ask for a manager because he was overwhelmingly rude. The people behind me backed me up on that, and he got in some trouble for that. Every time I go there and step into line, I see him die a little bit inside. And it may be petty, but it gives me such satisfaction. Sometimes I'll say I'm paying with exact change, and as I'm about to hand him the money, I'll say, Oh, I didn't realize I had rare coin from his collection in my pocket. I guess I'll pay cash. I just sold his expensive ratcheting wrench set, so on Monday when he works again, I'm going to go buy my daughter one of their better above ground pools. And as he's ringing it out, I'll tell him, I know that daughter is just going to love this pool. It's not like I would have ever used those expensive ratcheting wrenches anyway. Would you guys blame OP for showing up every so often to twist that knife deeper and deeper every single time? I mean, considering what OP grew up with, what OP experienced, all the things that this guy stole from OP, the countless ways they hurt OP all throughout their developmental years, is it a bad thing for OP to go and see their evil stepdad in this somewhat controlled environment and keep on pushing those buttons every single time? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. By the way, if you're enjoying these stories, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. That said, our final story of the day is from Nope, Don't Care At All, Don't Be A Snitch, Witch. I'm going to start this by saying that unlike most people who post things like this, I'm not sorry at all. I'm aware that what I did was, to put it mildly, evil, but honestly, I don't care. Make of that what you will. I did what I did. This story occurs in the early 2000s in a large urban city that I'm going to decline to name. I was 17 at the time. I was a heroin addict. My addiction had consumed the entirety of my life. My mother threw me out of our apartment after I stole our rent money for the second time to pay my dealer. She did the right thing. Not going to argue about it. I was a crappy human and, in a way, I deserved the life I ended up leading thereafter. 
I'm still a crappy human, but at least I don't get high anymore. I ended up a prostitute, not an escort. I was the type of working girl you found on street corners, not in the phone book with a booking agent. It wasn't a fun job, and the guy I worked for was a jerk, but he kept me high more often than not and didn't beat my butt too often, so as far as I was concerned, it was whatever. He had other girls besides me working for him. We'll call them Honey and Sugar. Honey was okay. She was a user like I was, and if I was short, she was always down to share a rinse or go in for a little extra to get me straight if I was feeling crappy and our daddy was in a bad mood and I didn't want to ask for an extra hit. I liked her, and so I never minded working with her. She also knew how to keep her mouth shut, which was something I appreciated. Sugar, on the other hand, was another story. This freaking witch. Anything she heard, she went right back to daddy's ear. Anything she saw got reported on. Kept something if you got a tip so you could buy some condoms or a candy bar? She's snitching. Spent a little extra time with a date? That mouth would run. The witch would never shut up, and Honey and I hated her for it. The crazy thing was that it didn't win her points with our daddy either. He didn't like any of that stuff any more than we did. He knew we did minor stuff, and as long as we weren't screwing with his money, he didn't give a darn about five bucks here or there because it meant we weren't asking him for stuff. But if she brought it to his attention, he had no choice but to do something about it. It got old fast. She was weird too. Even though she did all that stuff, she still somehow thought that we were all friends. Like she'd snitch and I'd get my butt beat and then the next day she'd act buddy buddy like she thought I just forgot what she did now that it was all said and done. She had the freaking audacity to be hurt when I didn't want to work with her and that honey and I would get quiet and ignore her if we had to be around each other. It was crazy. So yeah, safe to say I had a problem with her and I was waiting for a chance to screw her over royally. The opportunity came on a slow night. It was about 1am and it was pissing rain. I was tired. I'd been out since 9 and I'd only had one date, so I was sweating going home with a light take when this car rolls up. Nice car, a bit dated, but still nicer than most of the ones rolling around in the area, so I perked up. Window goes down and it's an older dude in his 50s. He had this super dark hair that I automatically knew came out of a box because his mustache was salt and pepper and the whole car smelled weirdly like mint. I didn't care. I needed the money, so I got in. He wanted full service, which was $100 in my pocket, which would be enough that I could call it a night and go home and my daddy wouldn't be too crappy about it. He'd be crappy because it's still a light bag, but I'd get my hit and I could go the freak to sleep and not be sick. Dude drives us to the back of this shut down bodega and I was ready to just get it done, so I was down. He and I moved to the back seat and he handed me my money and I looked down to stuff it in my bra and then I started pulling up my skirt. I only took my eyes off him for half a second, but all of a sudden the dude grabbed me by the throat with both hands and started squeezing. The funny thing is that I wasn't even surprised. I seriously considered just not fighting, just letting it happen. I was miserable. My life was crap and it wasn't like anybody would miss me. Would it be so bad? It wouldn't really be me ending things, which meant I wouldn't go to heck, raised Catholic. I see the irony in my thinking now, believe me. Prostitution and drug use? Okay. Ending things? Heck nah. Religion is a heck of a drug, kids. Just say no. In the end, I fought back. He had me halfway up against the door, so I pretended to be out and went limp. And he let go of my throat, to get his fly down, I guess. And while he leaned back off of me, I pulled my leg up and kicked him in the balls and then reached behind me and went for the door handle. It wasn't locked and I ended up on the ground on my butt. I got up and booked it down the street as fast as I could. Lost both my shoes in the process because no way was I trying to run in heels. Good news? I still had the money. My neck was bruised to freaking back, but it wasn't long before I was too high to care. Life went on, new day, same BS. Two months later, when it was in the middle of summer, me and Sugar were out together. Honey already had a date and I'd just come back from one, so I was making use of an alley for a bit of a cleanup. Sugar was standing on the sidewalk waiting, and then what do I see rolling down the road? The nice sedan. It slowed down, and I knew it was him. Same guy, same car, and Sugar was gonna take the date. 
the same date that almost killed me. He hadn't seen me where I was wiping myself off behind the dumpster, but I saw him. I could have said something. I could have yelled at Sugar and told her about the guy, but I didn't. I didn't say a word. I watched her get in that car, and I watched the taillights fade out into the distance, and I already knew Sugar wasn't going to be coming home that night. My witch, tell daddy some crap now. She didn't have a clue what she'd just gotten herself into either. See, I told Honey about the guy as soon as I got back. Told her how he looked and what car he drove and about how he smelled, so she wouldn't get in with the same psycho I did by accident. But I'd never warned Sugar. Maybe in the back of my mind, I was hoping that I'd have the opportunity to do what I did. Sugar didn't come back that night, or any other in the next year I worked. I only saw the car one more time, driving slow down the street to look at who was out. I waved and blew him a kiss. He did me a favor after all, so no hard feelings about the whole strangling thing. I sure as crap wasn't getting in his car again, but I wasn't mad about it. He looked so confused that he actually looked like he was going to stop for a minute, but I guess he thought the better of it because he sped up and kept going. I never saw him or that car again. Not too long after that, I got arrested, which led to me actually getting clean and getting my stuff together. Never told anybody about what I did that night until now. Never told the cops about him either because A. I was doing my own dirt and B. As long as Honey wasn't getting in his car, I didn't give a freak who else he picked up. Still don't. Not my problem. No idea what happened to Sugar after she got in the car that night. I never heard anything about her again, and neither did anybody else that I know of. No body ever showed up either, so it's not 100% certain that he killed her? But I think he did. I know he was planning on killing me that night. It explains why he didn't complain about the fact that I told him money first. He just handed it over, no argument. No half now and half when I get off. He figured he'd just get it back when he was done. Not like I was going to need it anymore. Joke's on him. I got away and I didn't have to screw him. Sometimes everybody wins. Except Sugar, that is. Because screw her. This is definitely one of those stories that after I'm done reading it, I'm kind of left without words. This is one of those stories where you really have an unfiltered, uncensored view of a window into somebody else's life that you've most likely never had any kind of first person account for. And hearing a story like this from the first person where you can put yourself in that situation in your mind, it just sometimes leaves you without words. I let my abusive elderly father go homeless. I'll start this off by saying that I don't consider myself a good person, though I've undoubtedly been the unfortunate recipient of a lot of abuse, bad luck, wrongdoing, etc. over the course of my life. I'd be lying if I tried to claim that I haven't also done my fair share on the other side of that equation, that I haven't also dished out abuse and wrongdoing to people who didn't deserve it. Maybe that's just how humans are. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. The point is, I don't write this story for any sort of sympathy. I don't write this story for any sort of compassion. I definitely don't write this story with any expectation of coming out looking like the hero or the good guy or any of that fairy tale stuff. I write this story rather because I think it's worth telling and worth sharing with people. Maybe some people out there will learn a thing or two from it. How to persevere through the bad times. How to deal with the worst hand possible and keep playing. But I really doubt it. I'm sure some people out there will be able to relate to at least some of this stuff. I hate that that's true, but I'm sure that it is. And maybe some people, the ones with the twisted senses of humor, the messed up sensibilities, maybe that crowd will even get a kick out of it. If that's you, more power to you in my book. We gotta stay entertained somehow, right? Anyway, I've rambled on long enough with all this background nonsense. At the end of the day, I'll tell my story and you'll make your judgment. It's as simple as that. So, here's my story. I had a bad childhood. Most of the time when people ask me about my childhood, and I can't get away with changing the subject or I don't have the energy to put on a normal face and act like I had one of those normal deals. Neat house in the suburbs, loving mom and dad, cute little dog Fido. That's all I say. I had a bad childhood. They obviously want to know more, but no one ever presses. People kind of have a way of looking in your eyes and knowing that some things aren't worth digging up. I know I had a bad childhood won't do for the purposes of this story, so let's go digging. When I was born, there were four people in my immediate family. 
myself obviously, my mom, my dad, and my older brother, who I'll call Cal. Up until the time I was 8 years old, my life, as I remember it at least, was actually pretty normal. My family wasn't well off, but we made do and we got along at least as well as any families expected to do. My dad was always kind of rough, kind of distant, but my mom, well, my mom was a saint. The only truly happy memories I have from my childhood are memories of her holding me as a boy, rocking and cradling me, singing songs, telling me she loved me, you know, stuff like that. Then, when I was 8 years old, she died. Lung cancer. I was still so young then, I don't remember very many details. I just remember how quickly it all happened. Her normal and healthy and smiling one day, then just gone the next. She didn't smoke or anything either. It just happened. Bad luck, I guess. Her death obviously affected me and my brother badly. I mean, I'm still probably not completely over it all these years later, but it was nothing compared to how it affected my dad. I don't know how to explain it other than to say that something changed in him the day she died. Something went away and never came back. All the normal positive human feelings, love and empathy and caring, I never saw them again. He was just a completely different person, downright hateful and cold and abusive. He was looking for someone to blame, is what it really was, and there's never anyone to blame in situations like those. So he had to find someone, build someone up in his mind as a target for venting all this pain and anger and frustration. That someone became me, unfortunately. I remember driving home from my mom's funeral. It was me and my brother Cal in the back seat, my dad up front driving. No one had said anything since we'd pulled out 15 minutes prior. Just the sound of the car moving, my brother and I staring out the window in silence. Then out of nowhere, my dad spoke up, addressing me. Let's say I'm John. You did this, John, he said. You know that, right? That you did all this? I wasn't sure what he was talking about. Did what, dad? He made sort of a sweeping motion with his hand. All of this, everything. Don't play smart with me. The least the devil can do is acknowledge he's the devil. I still didn't understand what he was saying. Remember, I was only eight at this time. But what did... Shut up, boy, he yelled. If it wasn't for you, maybe your mother would still be alive right now. If you... If you hadn't... He trailed off, obviously unable to come up with any rationale for how I, an eight-year-old boy, had been to blame for my mom dying. He didn't say anything else until we had reached home. After he'd pulled into the driveway and brought the car to a stop, he told Cal to go inside while he talked to me. When Cal had closed the front door behind him, my dad turned around in his seat to face me. I'll never forget the look of hatred in his eyes, like he was possessed by a devil or something. Your mom died because of you, he said, and I will never forgive you for it. After that, he got up and walked inside, leaving me to reflect on what I could have possibly have done to cause any of this. The answer is obviously nothing, but that's not the kind of easy answer a young kid's able to come to in the midst of grief and suffering, and especially not when the exact opposite is being drilled into his head day in and day out by the one who's supposed to be looking out for him and caring for him. And drilled into my head, it was. Far from being a one-time thing, an uncharacteristic outburst fueled by a really painful time, this sort of torture became my life. Every day after school, the only thing I would have to look forward to would be another round of abuse from my dad. Some of it was verbal, emotional, whatever you want to call it. Stuff about how I was a waste of oxygen, about how I should never have been born, never should have existed in the first place. Other stuff I won't even go into here because, well, because some things are honestly too obscene to even repeat, at least in my opinion. But eventually his torture got to be physical too. One thing that you should know is that my dad had always been a drinker. I don't know whether he had what you'd call a drinking problem before my mom died, but if he didn't, then he sure as heck developed one after that point. His favorite pastime in the world came to be getting knocked down drunk off whatever piss quality beer or liquor he managed to buy, and then beating me around like a rag doll until it was lights out for yours truly. I know some people who went through abuse like that say they eventually got used to it, that they eventually built up some sort of tolerance or numbness to the whole thing, but I didn't. I felt the hits every time, and my dad knew I felt the hits every time. 
Maybe he wouldn't have even bothered otherwise. But the worst part of it all, the worst part by far, was that my dad, in his sick twisted head, decided to leave my older brother Cal out of his line of fire. He never yelled at Cal, never told Cal he was a waste of oxygen, never so much as laid a finger on Cal. It was just me he targeted. Towards the beginning, Cal would try to stand up for me, plead with my dad to leave me alone, try to convince him that I hadn't done anything wrong, but eventually my dad got to my own brother somehow convinced him that I was to blame for every bad thing that had happened to our family. After that, it was all but over. It was a two-on-one. There was nowhere to run and there was nowhere to hide. I had a POS alcoholic abuser for a father on one side and a cold spineless bystander for an older brother on the other. So that was my life for a better part of a decade. When I finally turned 18, I was already planning on moving out on my own. But my dad could sort of sense I was about to leave, so he took it on himself to get the last laugh and just kick me out. I still remember it like it was yesterday. It was on the actual day of my 18th birthday. I remember already being in low spirits because birthdays were the worst days of the year for me. Why? Well, rather than maybe trying to dial back his cruelty for a day, my dad would use my birthday as an opportunity to crank the cruelty knob all the way to a thousand and really go after me for an entire 24 hours. That's if he remembered it was my birthday at all, which was not an automatic thing. He definitely remembered this one though. I was sitting in my room when I heard my dad yelling out my name from our living room. As I walked into the room, I saw him sitting in the ratty old recliner chair he basically lived in, beer can in hand and sick smile plastered on his face. When he began to speak, I could hear the alcohol slurring his words. Well, boy, he said, I guess it's finally time. I knew what he was talking about. I wasn't an idiot, but I was going to make him do it. If he wanted to kick his 18-year-old son to the curb, he was going to have to do it by himself. Time for what? I asked. He didn't say anything at first, just raised his hand and pointed out to our front door. When I didn't move, he finally spoke up. Time for you to take your good-for-nothing self out of that door and get out of my life. He wasn't smiling anymore. I didn't say anything. I calmly went back to my room, and for the next 30 minutes, I packed the few belongings I had into a small duffel bag. When I was done packing, I slung the bag over my shoulder, made my way out of the room, and passed by my dad without saying a word to him. As I opened the front door, he called out my name. I turned around. One last thing, he said, pausing for a second and pretending to be serious. Try not to die too quickly out on those streets. I'd hate to have to pay for those funeral expenses. Then he burst out into laughter, cackling and slapping his legs like he just told the funniest joke imaginable. I made my way out and slammed the door behind me. At the time, I thought those would be the last words my dad would speak to me. And for nearly 25 years, it seemed like they would be. I walked out of that house and never looked back. I started working whatever job I could find to support myself, saving up money when I could, but basically spending a good two years after that day being helplessly broke and with no other family I could turn to. For a while there would be periods, a couple weeks here, a month there, where I was basically homeless and could hardly afford food to keep me moving, but I never, never thought about going back to my dad and begging him for some type of help. In my mind, I would have rather have been dead than back to being dependent on him. Eventually though, I made it work. Once I'd become somewhat financially stable, I started taking night classes at a community college and working during the day. After getting my associate's degree, I was able to land a decent enough job in entry-level sales. A position I was able to slowly move up from over the years until I was a full-fledged sales manager. At that point, I'd had enough money to buy my own apartment and start living, by all appearances, a pretty normal life. It hasn't all been sunshine and smiles though. Going through what I did for that 10 year period doesn't exactly set you up to be a well-adjusted, normally functioning human. And in fact, it kind of does the exact opposite. I probably suffer from some sort of PTSD or panic disorder or something like that. But being the stubborn SOB I am, I've never been seen by any kind of specialist or anything. I've also avoided being close to people in general. I have a few good friends, but I keep them all at arm's length. I've had a few girlfriends over the years, but nothing ever works out. 
I think my childhoods just left me incapable of being truly intimate with someone. No kids, obviously. I would never want to risk somehow turning out like my old man did. To be completely honest, the one thing I wanted over the years, the one thing that would keep me up at night thinking and thinking and thinking, wasn't a wife or kids or even a bigger house, a nicer job. It was somehow being able to get back at my dad. Somehow being able to repay him for all the torture he put me through during my childhood. Screw forgiveness. Screw moving on. Screw letting the past go. I wanted revenge. For the longest time, I didn't think I'd ever be able to get it though. Once I'd made it and was living relatively comfortably, I tried looking my dad up in phone books, on the internet, through any avenue I could think of, but I couldn't find a trace of him. My brother Cal had died in a car crash about five years after I'd been kicked out, and there was no other family I knew about, so for all intents and purposes, my dad was just gone. I half suspected he was dead. Alcoholism has a way of doing that to you. So imagine my surprise, completely out of the blue, nearly 25 years since the day I'd been kicked out of my house. I received a phone call from none other than the devil himself. I had no idea how he'd gotten my phone number, still don't to this day. And when I picked up the phone and he first began speaking, I didn't even recognize his voice. John, he said in a really weak, gravelly voice, it's me. I'm sorry, who is this? I asked. I'm afraid I don't have this number saved in my phone. There was a long pause on the other end before I heard my dad's voice again. It's me, John, he said. It's your old man. I couldn't believe it. 25 years it had been since I heard this slime ball's voice in my ear. 25 years. My mind flashed back to the years of torture and suffering he'd put me through. Out of pure instinct, I was about to tell him to get lost and go freak himself. But then I realized this was my chance. This is what I'd been waiting for, dreaming of, all these years. Here was my chance to finally get revenge on my dad. I decided to play it cool and let him make the first move. Oh wow, I said, trying to play up some mixture of shock and excitement. It's been so long, dad. I paused, trying to muster the strength to go on talking like there wasn't three decades worth of anger trying to burst through me. How, how have you been? I've been alright, John, he said. But listen, I, I need your help. Things aren't great right now and I need somebody to help me out. Can you come to my place sometime this week so we can chat? Help? I say, what kind of help exactly? I think, he says, listen, John, I'll explain everything in person. Can you, can you just come by? I'll give you the address to my place. I paused for a second then. I'd already made up my mind, of course. The second my dad told me he needed help, I was more than ready to see what he needed and see just how thoroughly I could screw him over. But I had to act somewhat realistically. Take a second, think about it, make him squirm a bit. I couldn't let my dad suspect a thing. After about 30 seconds, I finally spoke up again. Sure, dad. Give me the address and I'll be there on Friday. I could almost hear him breathing a sigh of relief on the other end. Thank you, son. Thank you so much. A week later, on the Friday I told him I would meet him, I took off from work and drove to the address my dad had given me. At some point in the past 25 years since I'd last seen him, my dad had moved the state over and it took me nearly six hours of driving to get to his place. I didn't care though, I would have driven for three days straight if it meant the possibility of getting revenge on the man. When I pulled up to the address, I saw just about exactly what I was expecting, an absolute dump. The small one floor house was dingy, run down, and it looked like it was on the verge of being condemned. The whole front yard was overrun with weeds and grass that looked like it hadn't been cut in 20 years and the house itself seemed like it was in danger of collapsing at any moment. As I walked up to the front door, I smiled thinking about the long, miserable years my dad must have spent living in his dump of a home. I knocked on the front door, readying myself for whatever was about to happen. After a few moments it opened, and there he was, the man who had made my childhood such a living nightmare. Frankly, he looked nothing like he had the last time I'd seen him. His face was wrinkled and sunken looking, his hair had gone completely white, and I noticed he'd had to use a cane to support himself. After inviting me inside, 
He led me into his cramped, cluttered living room and, without asking me at all how I'd been or what I'd been doing for the past two decades, immediately launched into the speech I'd pretty much been expecting since he told me on the phone that he needed help. I won't bore you with specifics. It was pretty pathetic, honestly, seeing an old man grovel and beg so shamelessly, but it basically boiled down to this. The old man was completely and utterly broke, was too weak and frail to work a job to support himself, and would be evicted from his house, which he was renting in two weeks' time. Why? Because, as he told me towards the end of his speech, that's when the money runs out. That's when I'm left with nothing. So where do I come in? I asked, fully knowing the answer to the question. Son, I need you to help support me. I, I need food to eat, a place to sleep, somewhere to live. I don't have anything. I'm completely dependent on you right now. He paused for a few moments, desperately trying to up the sympathy factor. So do you think you could help me out? I looked down at my folded hands, pretending to consider his proposition for a while. When I looked back up at him, I was smiling. Absolutely, Dad. Of course I'll help you out. After promising I would find him a place to stay and get back to him within the next week, I left his house and immediately got to work. The first thing I did was look up the worst nursing homes in the United States. I spent a good two hours poring over lists of horrible facilities, articles about reported elder abuse, and anything else I could get my hands on. I needed to find the kind of place that shouldn't have been open at all and yet somehow was. After two hours of searching, I'd found my place. It was all the way on the other side of the country for me. The pictures of it online looked even worse than the place my dad was staying in at that point, and I read multiple news articles alleging that the staff had abused residents living there. Bingo. After finding a winning location, I moved into the next step of my plan and called the nursing home I'd decided on. When someone on the other end picked up, I asked to speak with the nursing home's executive director. I knew from the research I'd done that this was a locally owned home, meaning for my purposes that if I could get their director on the side of my cause, I was golden. No corporate BS to deal with and no oversight. Judging from the reviews I'd read of the place, I didn't think persuading them to see my side would be a problem at all. The place reeked of sliminess and corruption. When the home's administrative director finally picked up on the other end, a rough, slightly scary sounding woman with a deep voice, I told her I wanted to level with her for a second. I dove into the story of my dad and my horrible childhood, sparing no detail about every awful thing he had ever done. Then, after I felt I sufficiently covered the essentials, I ever so slyly transitioned and asked the director whether, under the right circumstances, she might be able to see to it that my dad gets, well, the worst treatment imaginable. The other end of the phone was silent for a second, then the director spoke up. And what would these right circumstances be, she asked. I knew what she was asking. Ma'am, I said, if you can personally assure me that this wish for my father is met to the fullest, I can see to it that you receive whatever the standard rate for a resident is for 12 months, directly to you obviously, and completely under the table. There was another pause before the director spoke again. That won't be a problem at all. After getting the verbal confirmation I needed, I moved to the last surprise I had in mind for my dad. One more thing, I said. Say, hypothetically, that a resident was able to pay the cost of residing in your facility for 12 months, but after that they just, I don't know, ran out of money. What exactly would happen to them at the end of the year? Well, the lady said, sometimes Medicaid will be able to cover the cost of living for a resident who has no other assets. She paused. But there are certain circumstances where we do have to evict such residents. It certainly happened before. And what are those certain circumstances, I asked. Sir, the lady said, I think we're on the same page. It won't be a problem. After I'd gotten my dad's living situation squared away, there was only one thing left to do. Introduce him to his brand new life. I told him on the phone that I'd bought him a really nice apartment. Lie. On the other side of the country where I lived lie that I really thought he was going to enjoy. Double lie. The entire way to the nursing home, from the car ride to the flight, he was practically jumping up and down with excitement. 
and wouldn't stop asking me questions about his new place. Every time he did, I would respond with a, you're just going to have to wait until we get there. When we finally did reach the nursing home, the smile almost instantly evaporated off my dad's face. What, what is this? He asked as our taxi pulled into the home's parking lot. The facility was even worse than the pictures online had shown. Depressing gray brick, fading paint, half-broken sidewalks. It hurt just looking at the place, so I sure as heck couldn't have imagined living there. After getting him inside and assuring him repeatedly that this wasn't a joke, I was finally able to get my dad settled into the room where he was set to be staying in. It was exactly what I'd hoped it would be. Small, dirty, ugly fluorescent lighting, squeaky linoleum floor, no windows, smelled like pee, a ratty looking bed, a single table, and nothing else. Perfect for my dad. After looking around for a while and not saying anything, my dad sat on the edge of the bed and just stared at the wall blankly. I decided it was time for the cherry on top. You want to know the best thing about this place, dad? He didn't say anything, just turned to look at me, so I continued on. I proceeded to tell him about all the great amenities the nursing home offered, the wonderful treatment he could be expecting, courtesy of me, and oh yeah, how I paid for only 12 months of residency. After that, I told him, he was on his own, so he better enjoy this vacation while he can. When I'd finished telling him about the great life he had to look forward to, I saw something pop up in my dad's eyes that I'd never seen before. Fear. I almost, almost started to feel bad, but then I was back to 8 years old, driving home from my mom's funeral, hearing my dad tell me how I had caused her death, how I was to blame for the suffering of our family. Any sort of sympathy evaporated at that instant. I made my way to the door then. I had accomplished what I'd wanted to accomplish, and I was ready to get away from my dad once and for all. I opened the door and paused before I walked out. One more thing, Dad. I paused, waiting for him to look up at me. Try not to die too quickly here. I'd hate to have to pay for those funeral expenses. I laughed myself all the way back to the airport. In your guys' opinions, after everything OP went through here, the traumatic childhood, all the blame being thrusted upon OP's shoulders needlessly, being kicked out by their old man the day they turned 18, Considering everything this guy did to their very own son, who had done nothing in return to him, do you think that that dad deserved this treatment? Do you think maybe what OP did was actually more than what OP should have done or had to do? I mean, it's a terrible place that they're staying at, but it's 12 months paid there. I'd like to know your guys' thoughts in the comments down below. That said, our story of the day is my cheating boss got a taste of his own medicine. Being a young, ambitious woman in the 70s was never going to be easy, especially in the north of England, but I never expected that my first job would turn into such a palaver. Still, I've never been a shrinking violet. I'd grown up in a working class part of Newcastle during the 50s and 60s. Tough families living on a thruppence, hanging their hand-washed laundry in the streets where the kids played unsupervised. All the mams had names like Agnes, Vera, and Maureen walked around with a cigarette in their mouths and chatted with their neighbors about what the young lass at number 28 had been doing with the lad across the street. It was that sort of life. I suppose you had to do something for entertainment when you couldn't afford a TV. They were good people, helping each other out where they could, despite having little themselves. However, I didn't want my life to be like that. I didn't want to marry a dock worker or a milkman, get married, get pregnant, and spend my life washing dirty undies in a tin bath. No, I wanted my own career, and to have all the nice things that the posh people had. So when I left school, I grabbed the paper and started scouring the job ads. Having aspirations, I decided that I didn't want to do factory or cleaning work. So I looked at one of the few other options available for a young woman starting out. Secretary work. I responded to a few ads before I finally got taken on by a firm not more than 15 minutes walk away from home. When they ring back to tell me that I'd got the job, I was chuffed. I felt like a proper grown-up. I remember how nervous I was on my first day. By now, it was the 70s, so I could slip into a pair of high heels and a miniskirt without half the disapproval I would have gotten had I been a young woman 20 years prior. 
In my mind, I expected I'd be walking into one of the newish, tall, concrete monoliths that were in the area. A big, booming business, I thought. As I walked down the road though, address in hand, I got to the end and couldn't find Wilson Bros Merchants. I nosied past the bit of old fence beside me and peered into grubby tract of land inside, piles of rusting metal and, then in the middle, a grey porta cabin. My heart sank. There, plastered onto its front, Wilson Bros Scrap Merchants. My dreams of a posh office had just climbed out of the window and bolted for Brazil. I, I'd been wet behind the ears to think I'd been jumping into a cushy job straight out of school. Ma'am always said I had an active imagination. I know I couldn't go back though. So, I slowly made my way into no man's land, traversing the uneven ground with a lot of trepidation. I definitely misjudged my choice of footwear that day, and not just because I ran the risk of breaking an ankle. When I got inside, there was a desk with a typewriter and phone, and behind that, the door to what I presumed was the boss's office. I knocked, got called in by a booming voice, and met the man in question. I've gotta tell ya, I was taken by him almost straight away. He was a good looking man, middle aged and dressed to the nines. He reminded me a bit of Sean Connery. My face must have been a picture. For a minute, I couldn't take my eyes off him. When he invited me to sit, I couldn't find my words. Even then, as young as I was, I knew that he must have picked up on it because he had a bit of a sly grin on his face. I was mortified. He introduced himself to me as Mike, ran me through my jobs, and then got me set up at my desk. Over the following days, I quickly realized that this wasn't exactly a booming business. The odd few customers and clients each day, a couple of lads working the scrap, and that was it. Just enough work to keep us all ticking over. After a couple of weeks into the job, I begin to notice that Mike hangs around the reception more and more, chatting and joking with me. I found myself more and more taken with him, and my heart fluttered every time he smiled at me. He had this cheeky twinkle in his eye. One day, he came in and sat on the edge of the desk. He smelt of Old Spice, which, to a young lass in the 70s, made him as sophisticated as they came. He asked me if I'd like to go see The Great Gatsby with him at the ABC. A romantic film starring Robert Redford? You bet I said yes. That evening, I went home and got doled up, making an extra special effort for Mike. I was already smitten. I wasn't going to tell Mam about it either. No, I was just going out with a friend, I said. Jackie, that girl I went to school with. I was going to have my secret romance and to heck with what anyone else might have thought. I'd just finished reading The Female Eunuch and had begun fancying myself as a shining example of a modern woman breaking out of the domestic chains. So off I went in my new orange dress and kitten heels, catching a bus into town. When I got to the cinema, I found him waiting outside, looking debonair in his wool overcoat. When he saw me, he turned and smiled, rubbing his hands together to shake off the cold. When we got our tickets and went in, would you believe it, he led me to the back row. As it happened, the first part of the film was a relaxed and uneventful affair from an us point of view. Well, apart from dropping a piece of popcorn down my dress. When the first interval came, we both got an ice cream from the usher and settled back down. Gently, he notched up the dial by whispering a few naughty jokes here and there. At one point, an old woman in the front turned and hushed me because I couldn't hold back the giggles. After the film was over, we walked out and stood looking at one another for a moment. Then he took my hand and kissed it, telling me that he'd hoped I'd enjoyed the evening as much as him. I attempted to keep it together, but I fear I probably came away looking like a gibbering mess. I beat myself up for acting so girlishly on the bus ride home, thinking I'd made a fool of myself. I put on a brave face as I went into work the next morning, having no clue as to what to expect. As it happened, Mike came into the reception shortly after I'd settled down and sat on the chair opposite, leaning onto the desk. Smiling, he asked how I was. Well, my bottle went, didn't it? I was back to the awkward stuttering and blank mind. He outstretched his large hands and placed them over mine. I thought my heart might go bang, and said gently, How way, lass, there's no need to be shy. Take a breath and start again. Well, I did, and somehow I found myself again. I apologized for how I'd been, but he quickly assured me that I'd done nothing wrong. In fact, he told me that he'd been delighted by how mature I was for my age. A fine young lass, he called me. 
It was around a week or so after our first date that he invited me to dinner at a new Italian restaurant in the city center. Did I say yes? You bet. I was a 70s working class girl who just lived through the three day week. I wasn't about to say no to a bit of luxury. I asked him to pick me up a few streets away from my house to avoid my ma'am seeing. After we parked up, we got out and started walking down towards the restaurant when a mustachioed fella and a Mac called out to Mike. The man's name was Jeff and he was a turf accountant, as well as a friend of Mike's. I was introduced as his secretary and when he learned that we were having dinner together, Jeff looked between us with a slightly wary gaze. At the time, I wrote it off as misgivings about the age gap. Perhaps I should have known better. The meal itself was wonderful. Lots of laughs, subtle flirtation, and the food? A million times better than beans on toast. I got to learn more about him too. Like half of the male population at the time, he liked football, beer, and skimpy negligees. On women, that is. He was originally from South Shields, had a sister who scandalized the family by having a baby at 15, and visited his father's grave every other Sunday. I asked him why he wasn't married. He coolly answered that he'd not been in luck in love. There'd been potential candidates, but they ultimately let him down in the end. Still, he said, he remained optimistic that he'd find the one. Before winking at me, a little smile crept onto my face, regardless of whether I wanted to do it. When we'd finished, he dropped me where I started, but not before we shared our first kiss. It was my first kiss. Being the sophisticated young lass I was though, I kept a stiff upper lip and got out of the car, sending him off into the night with no more than a simple goodbye. And so began our romantic liaison. I hooked up with him for my first time in a rundown bed and bath by the sea. Mike took the concept of a dirty weekend altogether too literal by picking that grubby hovel as our base. It came suitably paired with a mad old woman who spat when she spoke and talked to herself when doing her rounds. Mike assured me that it would be a great little place, that it must have changed her hands and that he was sorry for this. I tried very, very hard to make it seem like I was okay with the setup. I think he persuaded himself that I was. Heck, I think I convinced myself that I was okay with it. I consoled myself with the fact that our room had a nice view of the sea. Not that we saw much of it, or any of the little town. It got to a point where I was lost in the moment, in conniptions, and then, then scratching noises on the door. I jumped out of my skin until I heard meowing, and then I knew it was the mad old woman's cat. My mood for the moment was starting to wane. Then I heard footsteps and mumbling, louder and louder until it was right outside the door. Oh, you've had a tinkle on the carpet, tut tut. The cat's owner continued talking to herself outside the door. Then she went off and came back up a few minutes later, rattling as she came. Then we heard her scrubbing the carpet, loudly, right outside. Cat pee really kills the mood. After our interesting experience there, the romantic arena was largely centered back in Newcastle. In fact, I could pin most of it down to that little porta cabin. There were two things that did yet immediately occur to me at the time. A. That our relationship's romance has quickly but subtly disappeared. And B. We seem to be going nowhere. It was just hooking up. It was great, I'll grant you, but I started longing for something a bit more substantial. I always try to pick the right time to bring it up, usually after a dangerous but exciting round of you know what, we nearly got caught by one of his workers once. Somehow we'd managed to keep it discreet. I even had managed to keep my parents out of the loop. Thank God too, my mother would have gone into conniptions if she had any clue. My father, maybe not so much. He was more interested in his pigeons, the horses, and brown ale. It's fair to say he wasn't a very hands-on father. Every time I'd confronted Mike, he palmed me off with platitudes. I got a bit fed up in the end and told him straight, I want more romance from you. He promised me a proper holiday. No half measures this time, he said. We would fly to Spain. A foreign holiday on a plane? This was a dream for me. I squealed slightly and threw my arms around him lost to the excitement. He laughed, telling me he had to go but that he'd be back soon. As it happened, he never did come back that day. By early evening, I began to worry. One of his workers, Terry, a sweet and chubby lad, told me not to worry and to get off. He said that this wasn't the first time he'd done it, and that he always turned up the next day. He promised that he'd just lock up and offered me a lift home. I gracefully accepted, feeling somewhat placated, but still just a touch anxious. True to his word though, Mike turned up the following morning. I asked him where he'd got to, and he apologized. 
said a friend had called him over. The friend was going through a bad divorce, was depressed, couldn't leave him. Like a little fool, I swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. It wasn't until I went to a record shop to buy the latest David Essex record that I got smacked by the truth. Whilst I was there, I ran into Jeff. He asked how I was, and I told him on top of the world. He says, and Mike? I say, oh, he's fine too. We're both fine. I smiled, feeling giddy that I could refer to us as a couple, even if it was only to his friend. He gave me a knowing look. He says, ah, so you two really are? I looked at him slightly perplexed. Mike hasn't told you? Surely, I mean, you're his mate, right? Looking back, I cringe at that moment. How could I have been so eminently naive? Jeff's demeanor changed, becoming a bit flustered. Thelma's a good lass, he whispered. She doesn't deserve this. Did you know they're getting married? That she wants a baron with him? Understandably, I was stumped. Thelma? You're not telling me that Mike is with someone else? He says, don't soft soap me, lass. I weren't born yesterday. And to make it clear, you're the someone else. With that, he stormed off. I just stood there not knowing what to think or feel. I put down the record in my hand and walked out. There was a little green space nearby with a bench, so I ambled over to it and took a seat. I'm the someone else? No, that can't be right. Me and Mike are a couple. We've been away together, had dinner together, spent time with each other. We're going on a big holiday. He's told me that he... No, that's it. He's not once said he loves me. We've never talked about the future. That's when it hit home. I was just his bit of skirt. God, I felt so sick. He'd been stringing me along, using me for his own pleasure. The deceit and disrespect wound me up to no end. I wanted to wear his balls as earrings. My first instinct was to barge into his office, first thing tomorrow, and give him a piece of my mind. By the time I got home though, the initial fury was coming down to a simmer. I decided that was too simple, so I thought about more creative ways to get back at him. Trash his office? Set fire to it? Put an ad in the Lonely Hearts? One cheating rat looking for quickies on an office desk must bring extra small protection. Mike Wilson of Wilson Bros. It was tempting, but I wondered if it would even get published. Probably not. My choice of plan took a few days to hit. I was chatting with Ma'am about films when she brought up Love Story. That poor lass, she said. And the lad, too. They'd only been married five minutes. Had me in tears by the end. Dear, oh dear. My mind snapped back to the moment in the record shop. He was getting married, Jeff said. Over my dead body, I thought. My first problem was knowing when and where. It was bad enough that I had no time frame, but there were dozens of churches in Newcastle. How was I supposed to pick out the right one? I'd have to poke around. My first port of call was the ever-reliable Terry. I caught him on lunch break, trying hard to make it seem like a chance encounter, and tiptoed around the subject. Yes, he was aware that Thelma and Mike were getting married. No, he didn't know when, he just knew it was soon, within the next few weeks. It wasn't much, but it was a start. What next? It's not like I could follow him. When I got back inside the porta cabin, I glanced at the door to his office, and then almost straight away, I had an idea. I sat down on my desk and waited, pretending to work, until he passed me and went out for a loo break. I dashed into his office and over to his desk, looking for anything that could tell me what I needed to know. Lots of papers scattered across his desk, all work-related. I shuffled through the drawers, finding a bunch of keys, mints, a bottle of whiskey, and then, at last, something that might help me. His year planner. I flicked through the pages almost quicker than I could skim them, but it didn't take long before I found a telling page, June 29th. A date I'll never forget. Scrawled into the box was, day off, with a drawing of two rings underneath. Just over a month away, I started wondering how long they'd been together. Surely longer than we'd been, if you even call what we had, together. As my mind started wandering though, I heard footsteps outside. I quickly closed the planner and shoved it back in its drawer, shutting it and taking a seat on the edge of his desk. Letting my skirt ride up just a touch, when he came in and saw me, he initially looked surprised, but quickly his face morphed into one of lasciviousness. Rat. He tried to initiate things, so I pretended to play coy by putting my finger over his mouth and telling him he'd have to wait. He grinned. In that moment, I realized that I had my work cut out for me, because I'd have to keep him at arm's length for five weeks. 
I managed it painfully with moderate success. I had to appease him a little once in a while every so often just to keep him from suspecting anything, but I avoided anything too far. In the meantime, I gave his office one more search. I eventually ended up going back to the planner, where, at the back, I found a section for phone numbers. There was no church name listed, but I did find the number for another Wilson, an Edith Wilson. When I got a quiet moment, I gave the number a ring. An old-sounding woman answered. I introduced myself as a secretary, and she eagerly cut in, exclaiming that she was Mike's mother. She was evidently proud of him. He'd done so well, you know, built himself up from nothing. I felt sick again. I bared it though, tactfully broaching the subject of his little boy's wedding. Thelma was a fine young woman, a classy lady. Her father was a well-regarded local artist, apparently. I said I was ringing because I wanted to check the wedding venue. I'd been put in charge of making sure the business kept ticking over in his absence. I didn't want to bother a busy man like Mr. Wilson with trivialties. Mrs. Wilson was very understanding. Of course you don't want to bother him. Of course you'll need to know where he'll be. You'll want to ring him if anything urgent comes up. I thanked her aloud for helping me, and silently for putting the final nails in her son's coffin. The end of June 1974 was sweltering. You couldn't sit for a minute without sticking to your clothes. I was never one for the summer. Gray skies and rain for me. On the remorseful day, my first task was to decide how to present myself. Part of me wanted to rock up in full makeup, heels, and the naughtiest dress I could find, just to show him what he'd be missing. But then I changed my mind. This day was going to be bad enough for Thelma without me competing with her. Besides, the rat didn't deserve my best efforts. I decided to wear the formless gray dress that I wore when going to my nan's, the prudish Catholic one I mentioned, with a pair of flats and no makeup. I grabbed my black clutch bag and off I went. Whilst I was on the bus, I wondered if maybe I was in the wrong. Maybe he'd be faithful once they were married. Maybe they'd have kids and a Ford Cortina and live happily ever after. Was I taking it all away? But then I thought of Margaret and Barry two doors down. She cheated on him, and then again, and again. No, why should he be any different? That poor lass is planning a life with him, seeing far into the future, whilst he can't see any further than his trousers. She deserves better, and so do I. When I got close, I peered around the church's road and saw the final few guests entering the church. She would be here soon. I was beginning to feel anxious. About five minutes, a creamy white Rolls Royce cruised towards the church, complete with ribbons. She stepped out and my jaw dropped. She was beautiful, older than me, late 20s or early 30s, and immaculate. I felt daft, forever thinking I could compete with her. When she went in and the doors had closed, I slinked up to them and listened. I knew that there was a moment when guests could raise objections. So I waited. Although it felt like forever, I heard the vicar say it. Speak now or forever hold your peace. I pushed the church door open without a second to spare through the entrance and into the church itself. Hundreds of eyes turned to face me, but I met only one pair, and his quickly filled with dread at the sight of me. I said, I have an objection, vicar. The bridegroom's been having a relationship with me. The church was deathly silent. The vicar didn't know where to put his face. The guests were gobsmacked, and as for Thelma, all she could do was look between him and me. It's not true, he tried to communicate softly. The echo in the church wasn't about to let his lie creep away quite so easily, though. Not that it mattered. It was clear he was lying. I knew it. She knew it. We all knew it. He'd been caught with his pants down, so to speak, and there was no way out. I saw her face contort into anger and expected her to slap him, but she exceeded my expectations by lunging at him, thumping him on the chest. She really went for him. What happened after that, I don't know. I left them to it and never heard about either of them again. Truth be told, I found the whole thing a very sorry affair in the end. As soon as I could, I left Newcastle and never looked back. I found work in a new life in London and ended up training to be a teacher. I've had a few boyfriends since Mike, some good and a couple not, did a bit of traveling with a new pal I made, and made sure I never wasted another minute more than necessary. Contrary to my younger self's expectations, I never did quite rid myself of domestic chains. 
I married an accountant, someone has to, and had a daughter with him. When she was four, we settled into a lovely house in Richmond where we still live. Lots of happy memories have filled this home over the years. I wouldn't leave now if you paid me. She's now all grown up and engaged herself, giving me pause for thought. The cycle of life continues. New adult lives are getting off the ground? It's quite a humbling realization. Still, I have no intention of fading into the background. You can take the girl out of Newcastle and all that. I still sometimes wonder what happened to Mike. How many more women did he use before he got old and shriveled? Did he ever get old? Part of me wishes that I hadn't done what I did, even if only for Thelma. But then I remember that, in the end, she was probably better off for it. Then, the regret just vanishes. So considering OP went and waited for the very last possible second to drop this bombshell, literally standing at the altar, right when the words, speak now or forever hold your peace are uttered, OP bursts in there and drops the bomb. Was OP in the wrong for doing it the way they did? Should OP have just tried to reach out to Thelma as soon as possible and inform them? You know, blow this up before it ever got to this point? Or do you think OP waiting and creating this huge scene and just exploding everything right at the very apex of it? A totally justifiable thing in your eyes. Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. My mother destroyed my childhood, made me fail out of college, and laughed when I was homeless. I destroyed her entire freaking life. After almost 25 years of violent abuse by my mother, I finally got the kind of revenge I've always dreamed about as a kid going through the worst of it. But it didn't make me feel the way I expected. I'm sorry this post is so long. Reddit's the only place I ever really talk and write about my life in detail. I'm also sorry to all the people who suggested I take the high road. I didn't. You were alright. It didn't make me feel better. I know the deliberate steps I took to purposely ruin my mother's life makes me a bad person. I'm willing to accept that and I'm going to continue trying to become the person I believe I can be. You can skip to the end if you don't want a rehash of my subpar life and would rather read an update. Lastly, if my sister ever reads this, I'm sorry I wasn't a better brother. Rehash. For those who weren't aware of my life, I'll try to summarize it all, but it's not something that's easily put into a short paragraph or two. Growing up with my mother was worse than heck. If you've ever wondered what it would be like if your worst enemy went back in time to raise you, you'd understand my life. At some point around 9 or 10, I began to realize how alone I was and how exhausting my life would turn out to be. I kept hoping this time she'd finally just continue wailing on me, hoping she'd just never stop and finish the job. Either that or I'd be so close to gone she'd be forced to take me to the hospital where they would question her and I'd somehow be saved. It seemed like nobody ever cared enough to look deeper. Dislocated my shoulder with a cast iron pipe, hurting me every night until I ate things I was slightly allergic to, and then hurting me more for throwing it up. Lit my Christmas presents I got, then having to be held back by her boyfriend at the time, because she was holding a knife to my neck, telling me for the millionth time that I was worth less than my father, and nobody else would care if she did it. I could fill pages with all the things she did to me. I remember when she really started digging in and telling me I was worthless nearly every day. I was 13, and it was the first time I started contemplating ending things, though I was always too weak to follow through. My mother tried to get rid of me three or four times if you count a half-attempted poisoning. I say half-attempted because I vaguely remember the details, but... It involved her forcing me to consume something that had bleach in it. It's kind of funny in a sick way because I didn't even remember that until now. And that's not as bad as all the things I've put a lot of effort into not remembering. I just have a crappy memory so I guess it helps. I don't think I've actually went longer than a few weeks without being beaten bloody over something trivial, like not washing dishes fast enough or walking away too hard after just getting hurt by her. Years of physical and psychological attacks. Did I call the cops? Of course I did. Can you imagine how hard it was to watch my mother smile and lie to the cops, telling them I was exaggerating? Then having to watch them get into their cars and drive away knowing I had to go back inside? In the beginning, I had hoped things would change. Towards my teen years, I started drinking and stopped caring. And now here I am after all of it, somehow still alive. 
My stepdad used to tell me years after his divorce with my mother that he only stayed with her because he was afraid she'd be successful in getting rid of me one day. He's lucky he never saw how much worse it got when he wasn't there to take the hits for me anymore. It would break his heart. He was also the one who told me about my mother's being assaulted while growing up in a different country, which helped me gain some perspective in my teens. Not that it made much difference by then. It didn't matter to me because each and every day she had a choice every time, and she'd choose to hurt me every time. Maybe I'm overstating things considering that she didn't actually end me even though she's come close many times. Maybe that means deep down she secretly cared about me or something? I don't know. I don't think about it. She did go out of her way to buy me new electronics often, but she'd end up using those as leverage against me and invading my privacy constantly, so it ultimately wasn't that much of anything. After everything and all the time she kicked me out from 13 to 17 years old, I was always on edge. She told me when I was 18 that I was staying with my aunt, that if I went to college, I'd always have a place to live. I don't know why I believed her. I'd went to go stay with my aunt temporarily for 4-6 to six months after my mother kicked me out of the house at 17, but my mother would always stop by and buy groceries for me or leave me cash. She was unnaturally kind to me while I was there. By this point, she wasn't hitting me anymore. Not that she could as I would have snapped and absolutely wrecked her stuff at that age. But I strongly dislike hurting people in any form so the point is moot. And was more so prone to just verbal attacks. But since I was never really around her anymore, life seemed to get easier. My mother had learned more than enough ways to screw with me without touching me. It seemed like she hated me more than I hated myself at times. My aunt couldn't have me stay with her anymore as she really liked her privacy. I'd already been there for a while, and I was an emotionally damaged and rebellious teenager. She didn't have time to help. So I went back to my mother's house for the last time and started attending community college full time. I didn't really have any desire or passion. I was just an empty husk going through the motions. But I was still trying my best to keep living, even when I didn't feel the will, in the hopes that one day I'd feel something different for once. My mother, of course, decided to go back to her old habits. Things like dumping all the trash with dirty diapers and old food or dirty dishes filled with water on my bed when I was out if I forgot to do them, and sometimes just because she was in a mood. Locking me out in the snow for hours because I didn't respond to a text or something, even if I had class in a few hours. I wasn't even allowed to have keys. She would pretend not to hear me when I rang the doorbell or knocked for hours. She'd also tell my younger sister to ignore it. I'd eventually end up having to sleep on the steps outside or at a friend's house and get punished for doing it, even though I was 18, because it was her house and her rules. It was always non-stop. I had no real direction, and I honestly had no plans to exist past 25 years old. Despite literally all of that and then some, I was doing well in school, community college, with a 3.6-ish GPA. I finally left my mother's house for the last time a few days before finals week. I came home from drinking with friends and was met with my mother glaring at me when I rang the bell at 9pm, yelling when I'd move out as soon as I walked in. She followed me to my little closet of a bedroom where I tried to close the door behind me and she half ripped the door off the hinges. I just sat there on my bed and stared at her silently as she kept cursing and screaming questions at me. My mother then walks away and as I'm in the kitchen getting juice, I hear her on the phone calling the cops on me, claiming she was scared I'd kill her or my younger siblings. I just didn't have the energy to deal. This was three days before I failed all of my finals because I couldn't even make it. I was dealing with too much. So I went and grabbed whatever I had and left 15 minutes later. My mother and I only ever really communicated via email after, though it was very rarely and it was very businesslike. I'd tell her what I needed, and she'd either tell me to buzz off or give it to me. It was hard to maintain consistency in my life then. I was at rock bottom all the time. I didn't care about anything, I drank every day, and hung out with the worst kinds of people who brought out the worst in me. I bounced between cheap rooms and couches. It was early 2016 when I discovered photography, and it completely changed the direction of my life. 
I didn't hang out with anyone or bother trying to maintain all the pointless relationships. I just dove headfirst into it. I was able to put the things I didn't understand about myself into perspective. For the first time in my life, I felt something. Not like a feeling per se, just like this sense of possibility. For the first time, I was seriously wondering just what I could be capable of. I had something to look forward to. I felt like if I pushed myself as hard as possible, I had to be good at something and I had to be a good person. And so I isolated myself from nearly everyone I knew and spent every single day learning or practicing or being frustrated that I wasn't getting results. Even though I was drinking heavily, I always held a job and kept doing photo shoots and kept practicing like mad. I eventually got my first apartment and was functional for a year. Did I have my crap together? Heck no, but I was figuring my crap out. Cue one of the worst days of my life. Me getting robbed while I was blackout drunk for two months rent and camera gear by a friend, which led to me losing my apartment and job. Followed by an email by my mother asking how I'd been. We ended up talking on the phone and it was civil for like three minutes before I mentioned how hard things have really been for me. She was bragging about some new expensive speaker system she bought, and I, like an idiot, asked her for money, about $100. I told her if I could give my landlord anything, he'd be reasonable and give me time to get more cash together, and I'd be fine. That obviously didn't go well at all. It all escalates to her literally laughing and then telling me it was my own fault for being homeless. She also completely denied ever abusing me when I stated I was in the situation because of her. I hung up on her. My thoughts were all over the place, and I felt this intense frustration more so than anger. Within a few moments, my head cleared, and I decided something as I was sitting in my bedroom five or so minutes after the call. I decided that I was going to completely ruin my mother's freaking life no matter what. Revenge? And so I did. I called CPS on her and informed them of my history of abuse at her hands. I informed them about the dozens upon dozens of old photos I have of myself all bloody and bruised. I previously compiled as much evidence as possible in my teens, though never did anything with it until that point. That sparked a visit which led to an emergency removal of my three younger siblings when they caught my mother punishing my little sister coincidentally when they happened to do a visit. My mother was also arrested but released hours later. I reached out to the job she got years ago with the fake resume she made me write for her and made them aware of her falsehoods. Because of her field, it was promptly looked into and she was fired as well as blacklisted. She lost a nearly $80,000 plus salary. I then deleted every email and all of the email accounts I made for her because she never changed the passwords. Afterwards, I deleted the email accounts themselves. Within a few weeks, things were definitely going downhill for her. My youngest sister's dad was engaged to my mother and is now trying to file for sole custody of my little sister who's in CPS custody. I'm sure he wasn't happy finding out what his baby daughter had in store if my mother was given free reign. She missed her card appointments, and I know she hasn't been able to pay her mortgage since last year, as I've heard she had to ask one of her friends for money. Her life had become a creamy, messy, poop symphony, and I was the fecal splattered conductor. It was all going to crap. She went radio silent for months, and had a warrant after missing another court date. This was all fall slash winter of 2018 that she was off the grid. So I went on with my life. Early 2019, I get a random call from her and find out she went to her home country months ago after everything went to crap. How was she allowed on a plane? I have no clue. So cue another geyser of BS spewing from my mother's mouth. She's telling me I need to tell Child Protective Services she's a good mom and that she's never abused them or me. It's unbelievable. So I cut her off and I shut her up. I was a little buzzed when she called and had always mentally prepared for this moment. I started slowly telling her in graphic detail about all the gross stuff I used to do to her food because screw it. I told her how I used to pee in the pitcher of the Lipton iced tea she used to force me to make for her and then not allow me to have. 
I told her how I'd secretly sabotage her utensils with my butt cheeks before serving her food. She was quiet at first, but then began cursing me out. Though it didn't bother me, I'm on a roll, and I wasn't listening. Her words didn't matter to me anymore. She's blaming me for her life turning out so terribly, while fully unaware of how true that statement is in terms of the situation she was currently in. She shuts up long enough for me to get one more word in before hanging up and blocking her number. I thought that was the end of it. I expected my last post to be my final update, but as I've said before, my life is a crap symphony. The official update, my aunt and I recently reconnected about two months ago. Prior to last month, I haven't seen her in years. We met up and had a long conversation about life and everything, and then she admitted that she talks to my mother nearly every day. She had mentioned all the things that happened to my mother, but didn't know it was me who started this all. She actually felt really bad for my mother, but my aunt was always a really caring person, so I understand, I guess. I told her I was very uncomfortable with the thought of her talking about me to my mother and asked her not to. My aunt did it anyways. After meeting up with my aunt, I learned through her that my mother was finally coming back to America. She was arriving at the airport in one week. The problem was, my aunt told her that I was going with her, so the three of us could all talk without telling me. I didn't know what the feeling of betrayal really felt like until my aunt told me that. To be honest, as wrong as it sounds, I'd rather my mother just think I died or something on our phone call. But my aunt kept insisting that I had to give my mother another chance, and I had to learn to be open-minded and that though she wasn't there all the times, my mom did horrible crap to me. She loved us both and wanted us to get along. Like I'm supposed to just get along with someone who's tried to end me? Like she's choked me awake for school. If you don't know what it's like to forcefully wake up not being able to breathe and seeing your own mom standing over you at 5am angrily and tightly gripping your throat, count yourself lucky. But as I said at the beginning of the post, I've already resolved myself to being a bad person, and so I lied to one of the only people who was kind to me, and I promised to my aunt I'd try to have a heart-to-heart with my mom and her, and talk out the nearly 20 years of abuse. Obviously, that was not happening. When we got off the phone, I called the detectives, who gave me their number months back in case I heard from my mother. I asked them a few leading questions about what would happen if so-and-so were discovered, and then I made my plan. I wasn't sure if my mother would make it past customs. How was she able to travel to a different country with a warrant? I didn't know, but if she did, I'd call the police in the bathroom and wait for them to arrive while I sat with my mother. Cue my mother making it past freaking customs because she's my mother. She's a horrible person, but she's good at what she does, which is being horrible. I digress. My mother calls my aunt when she's getting off the planes, and my aunt says she's going to meet her. I told my aunt I'd wait for them in the little Starbucks, and then we'd all drive somewhere else. My aunt agreed and went off. I called the detective and told them that my mother was standing a few feet away from me, and if they could meet me at our destination, we were going to. They told me that was unnecessary and that they'd have officers closer to me come and apprehend her at the airport instead. And so I waited and waited, and then I finally saw them arriving, both at the same time. The three to four officers who had convened in those few passing minutes and actively searching around the food court I sat close to. My mother and my aunt walking down the gate towards me. I felt this overwhelming weight in my chest just kind of settling down deeper and deeper into my gut the closer they got and the more the officers searched. What if they stopped looking when my mother arrived? What if my mother somehow got away with this crap again? Countless thoughts, but I bit them back. I've grown very talented at silencing whatever my inner turmoil of the day happened to be, but my mother and my aunt were animatedly talking as they made their way to where I was sitting. Before they had a chance to say anything, I quickly jumped up and said, I ordered some teas, let me go see if they're ready, which was the first thing I could think of as they were sitting, but it worked and I dashed off past the cash register to the Starbucks and to the outer part of the food court. Looking back, saying I had to go grab some tea probably wasn't the best thing to say, but I digress. I made it a few feet out the door and half-jogged over to the officers who were still looking around the food court area. 
From where they were, they wouldn't have seen us sitting. I walked over and asked them if they had gotten a call about a woman who had a warrant or something. I mentioned that the detectives said officers in or near the airport would arrest her. They said they did, and I told them it was my mother. I told them her first name and they verified her last name. I told them she was sitting right in the Starbucks waiting for jail, and one of the cops chuckled, seemed a bit surprised and judgy that I was pointing them right to my mom. I told them I'd go make sure she didn't leave, and they followed behind by like 10 to 15 faces. I half jogged back inside and up to the little table where they were sitting. My mother had that half scowl she always wore whenever she looked up at me. When I popped up out of nowhere, and my aunt began asking me where the drinks were, before I cut her off and looked dead at my mother and her scowling face, which had quickly turned into confusion when I'd finished my sentence. Mom, I know we don't get along, but I wanted to let you know it's all my fault. Cue my mother starting to ask me with this kind of soft motherly voice, what do you mean it's your fault? Why do you think? But of course I cut her off because there's nothing she hates more than being cut off and I finally have the power in the situation. I say, look, witch, I want you to know exactly whose fault it is and whose pee you drank while you're sitting in jail wondering why the world did you so wrong. She sputtered something and slapped the freaking crap out of me. My aunt's jaw dropped. People are watching. The cops saw it happen as well, as only a few seconds had passed from when I walked in. Into handcuffs she goes. Now she's showing her true colors cursing and saying all kinds of things you couldn't imagine a mom saying to her kid, telling me she'd freaking kill me and so on, etc. I calmly walked behind them as long as I could until they took her to some room and held her until the detective arrived. I wasn't there that long, as the lack of thrill of it all kind of got to me, and I went home to break a two-month sober streak. I was there long enough for my aunt to tell me she was disappointed in me and that she doesn't know if she can forgive me for doing something so spiteful and disgusting to her sister. To be fair, I did it completely out of spite, so she isn't wrong. I've already acknowledged I'm not a good person for what I did. Come to find out, my mother was using my aunt's passport to leave and come back to the country multiple times since she left. That's why they never caught her. Now, my aunt has some explaining to do, but I wish she didn't have to get caught up in all of this. She's always been kind to me and doesn't deserve it. My mother's facing up to 10 years just for using my aunt's passport alone, and a slew of other charges, including one for child endangerment. Her husband left her. Her kids were taken from her. Her friends have seemingly distanced themselves from her from what I know. After 19 years of abuse, I finally get my revenge and none of the charges have anything to do with me, which is interesting. Did it feel good? No, I felt nothing. Just the rise and fall of the situation, but nothing really concrete. I expected to feel something. Not even satisfaction or happiness, but something. Either way, the only thing for me to do is to continue working towards the person I want to be. She told me constantly that I was worthless and that I'm nothing. I've told myself the same consistently as well in the past. I've decided that I'm going to become one of the greatest photographers of my time, and I'm going to push myself as hard as possible to succeed, so that anyone else who has ever suffered how I have now have no reason to doubt themselves or their ability to be great one day. As for me right now, I currently live in a homeless shelter. I decided to go to one six months ago after realizing all the drinking and inconsistency was making it hard for me to move forward. I wasn't saving money and was couch hopping from friend's house to friend's house. A few weeks ago I got a voucher from the government and sometime in the next two months I can find a one bedroom or studio apartment. I've been aggressively saving my small checks. I've been practicing and working on building better habits and just being a better photographer. I don't make much right now, and I know many people will say it's a stupid dream, but I know if I put all of my effort into making this work, I can not only be a self-sustaining photographer, but more than that. My situation is embarrassing, and it's hard, but I know I won't be here longer than another few months. It's not some dream, it's a plan. I'll also be going back to school in the fall and pursuing photography. As for my siblings, that situation is still a bit dicey, and I don't think I'll give an update about that, but they're all doing very well. As far as my mother's concerned, 
as horrible as she was towards me, the only part of me that even thinks about her on rare occasions hopes she isn't having a horrible time. I don't like knowing that people are hurting. This is definitely a story where you just can't help but feel bad for OP, but I think we can all agree that we're rooting for OP to continue to move forward and become a better photographer and be able to support themselves doing the things they love. Another person that seems caught in the crosshairs that OP seems rather conflicted about is their aunt. And sadly, I think the aunt is just one of those people that wants to help out anybody they can, you know, they don't want to upset anybody. But clearly their interest in trying to maintain relationships with everybody and keep everybody happy together led to them making some terrible decisions for themselves. Giving up your own passport and allowing somebody to fly around out of the country and back in when they've got a warrant out for their arrest? Like as much as you love your siblings, you're really putting yourself in the crosshairs there potentially. Considering everything that happened here and where the mom ended up, do you think the ultimate punishment here for the mom was worthwhile considering all they had done for so long? Or do you think 10 years minimum in jail is not enough and should be even longer? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Guys bully me for years? I get some slight revenge. This is the one time I felt proud of myself in my life. Let me set the stage. The revenge happened about 5 years ago. I came from a well off family. We weren't rich, but we weren't poor. Well, when I was 8, my dad died in a car accident from a truck driver who ran a red light. My mom ended up having to work as a part-time escort just for a little extra cash to keep me and my sister alive. Me and my little sister ended up moving schools because she got expelled for attacking a kid. She had autism and sometimes she gets mad to the point of violence. At the new school, I immediately started getting bullied. I was tormented by this one group of kids constantly for 7 years. They mocked my sister for being autistic and said that I'm probably going to follow in my mom's footsteps of sucking for money. Every day it was non-stop torment. In my senior year of high school, I had had enough. I enacted my revenge during the last month of school. The months prior to this, I had been studying up on their schedules. Where they go after school, when they leave, when they arrive, where they live, etc. It was very stalkery, but I don't know fam. Then, after countless stalking and planning, I was ready. First off, some minuscule things. I poked simple holes all around their water bottles so when they opened them, it leaked everywhere. I unscrewed their desk legs to make their desks break even from slight pressure. I did everything I could to agitate them. Then I went on to bigger things. I'd spray coyote urine on their stuff and then fill them with animal poo. I wrecked their stuff beyond comprehension. They did worse to me throughout my life, and they deserved it. Now here's where it gets really, well, illegal. They all play baseball together, so I decided to hit them there. They went to baseball practice, and I followed behind them. They left the locker room, and I went in there and did some practice of my own. I brought a machete and went to town. Their bags were ripped to shreds. Three of the seven had wood baseball bats, so I destroyed those. I also set up a trap for them. When they opened their bags, an M80 would ignite. I put a metric ton of river clay in their car transmissions and set up beds of nails in front of their tires. I wanted them to suffer. Here's where it's really illegal. I went to the main bully's house. He's a jerk. He purposely dislocated my shoulder for no reason once. He's the one that said the thing about my following my mom's footsteps. He peed on me, he assaulted me, he broke me, and I was gonna get my revenge. I waited for him to leave home and broke in. I crawled into his window and started having some fun. I disassembled his bed and computer. I moved a bunch of stuff in their house around. I turned on all the lights, all the burners, the showers, sinks, everything. I busted massive holes in their walls. I made a Craigslist ad advertising free rear entry for a petite gay guy and put his address and phone number. I opened a bunch of gay adult entertainment and viruses on his computer. I changed all their passwords, even their internet password. To top it all off, I followed a lesson from my idol, the PB. I went up to his room, took some laxatives, and coated his room in poo and pee. I wiped myself up, crawled back out, and left. I left no trace of it being me in there, but I'm guessing he knew. I overheard that the utility bill was extremely high and that he couldn't sleep in his room. He started failing at a high rate. Turns out he figured out it was me, attacked me, and got expelled. 
I don't know if I was in the right to do all of what I did, but I was proud and still am. If this story legitimately happened, I think it's safe to say OP, despite everything that they had happen to them, did not have the right to do nearly all of what they did. Would you guys agree with me that OP went way overboard here? Or considering all the harsh, harsh torment that they experienced, was it fair? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. By the way, if you're enjoying these stories, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. Our next story is from Up Constantinople. Abused wife and mother watches husband die. This happened in the late 90s, so enough time has elapsed to safely disclose. I had a friend back then who had been widowed for four years. She told me her story of victimization at the hands of her abusive and violent husband. She was mid-twenties when her husband died. She was married to a man 20 years her senior. They married when she was still a teenager, and they had a five-year-old son when her husband died. Her husband was an abusive and violent man who kept tight control over her and the boy. Though he never physically abused the child, he was emotionally abusive and very threatening toward their son. He saved the physical violence for his wife alone. During their marriage, she'd been savagely hurt many times. She had permanent scars on her body and had been hospitalized several times with broken bones and other serious injuries. She was in fear of her life every day. She was so controlled, she was a slave in her own home, fearful of ever stepping out of line. One form of control was to always know where she was at any given moment, and if she ever had to leave the house to shop or run errands, she would be timed. She was given a time frame to be back in the house, and if she was even just one minute late, she would be severely hurt. Her husband was a licensed gun owner who owned a legal rifle and ammunition as he enjoyed hunting, and he would take that rifle, hold it to her head, and tell her that if she ever attempted to leave him, he would hunt her down and end both her and their son. As well as hurting her, he would sometimes take the rifle, hold it to her head, and pull the trigger. It was unloaded, but that didn't diminish the terror she experienced each time, she told me. She said she was left in no doubt at all that if she ever ran, he would find them and end both. Another weapon he used against her was to threaten ending things himself if she ever left. Many people of that nature use the manipulation tool of threatening ending things or harming oneself to keep their victims tethered to them. When they threaten these things, they're causing the fear to rise within the victims so they don't leave. In this way, the threats are being used as a method of control. It's an incredibly common manipulation tactic used by people with borderline personality disorder, among other issues. Her husband did have dangerous medication in the house. I don't know what it was, and he would handle his bottle of pills whenever he issued a threat like that. One day she had to leave the house to shop for food. On the way back, she was caught in traffic that delayed her return to the house within the time frame she'd been given. She said the fear and panic was intense because she knew she would return to another serious hurting. She said it felt like her insides were being ripped out of her body as she pulled into the driveway 10 minutes late. She said she walked into the house in a state of blind panic, anticipating it when she saw him. He was motionless on the couch with the open bottle of pills on the floor beside him. She said she stood there and looked at him with a million thoughts of panic running through her head. Then she made her decision. She went to the other couch and sat down and looked at him. And she said that at that moment, her heart was pounding in her chest. She knew what he had done. He'd done it once before. She was supposed to walk in and find him breathing, but unconscious, and in a state of panic, call an ambulance for him, just like last time. But this time, she was 10 minutes late home. Last time she got help in time, but this time, she just looked at him. He wasn't breathing, no rise and fall of his chest. She said she looked at the clock on the wall and sat there looking at him, overcoming the panic and emotions, and stayed sitting there till 10 minutes had passed, till she knew he could not be resuscitated, and only then did she walk to the phone and make the call. She said the emergency services and police saw her obvious distress, the crying, the panic, the breakdown, and assumed it was the wife in distress at losing her husband. They didn't know they were watching someone who had just been rescued, someone who was at last free. The authorities did not doubt ending things as it was on record that he had tried it once before. 
That's the story of how one abused young wife and mother finally became free. P.S. She did rebuild her life, went back to school, learned her degree, and moved on to build a solid and safe life for herself and her son. I haven't seen her for years, but have no doubt she has never had any regrets over sitting on that couch that day and watching it happen. I think all you can really say about this is it's just an insane story from start to finish. If you ask me, I don't understand how the husband could even do such a thing to another person that they're supposedly caring about. I mean, not only laying your hands on people like that, but restricting them that way, putting time limits on them, treating them like property basically. I just can't put myself in that kind of a mindset of how you'd have to think and feel to just do such things. And our final story of the day is by Fred Krissa, Life Ruining Revenge, Six Years in the Making. I've had an on-again, off-again relationship with this girl since junior high. We've constantly been in each other's lives, even to this day we still talk. I thought I was in love with her, shocker, I wasn't. But in high school, things got pretty serious between us, and the more serious we got, the worse we treated each other when we fought. It was the most toxic relationship I've ever been in, but we're actually great friends now. At the time, I was working stock crew at the mall toy store. Sometimes it was an early morning shift, sometimes it was overnight, so my sleep schedule was all messed up. We were dating and sleeping together pretty regularly my entire senior year. She had her circle of friends, I had mine, and they rarely intersected. Enter Jerkhead Kyle. Now, Jerk Kyle gave a bad name to all other monster-chugging, drywall-assaulting Kyles. He was physically and mentally abusive to his girlfriend, later wife. He manipulated his friends into letting him walk all over them, got one girl hooked on pills after he got her pregnant so she would be forced to give the baby up. Just a next-level scumbag. Kyle was part of both of our circles. He was friends with a few acquaintances I had, and the girl was pretty close to his girlfriend. The girl and I had just had a really bad fight a few days before, and had made up in our usual way. As I was getting ready to go to bed for work for the next morning, my phone went off. It was a text from Kyle, followed by three pictures. One inappropriate photo of my girlfriend, one of my girlfriend and his, and the last one only half loaded, but it was clearly a picture of my girlfriend giving him a present. I was furious, but as I was already graduated, I wouldn't run into him again to take my rage out the traditional way, so I just said forget it and moved on with my life. I was still mad at the girl for cheating on me again. This happened multiple times on both ends, so it was forgiven pretty quickly. So we fought it out a few times and eventually made up when she told me the whole story. Kyle had told her that I was sleeping with his girlfriend's sister or something and that this was how she should get back at me. Now was it pretty dumb? Absolutely. But he wasn't so bright and the story wasn't so far-fetched that she didn't believe him. She told me that since it was BS on his end, she was done with both of them, and we went on with our lives. The start of the long game. A few years go by. The girls move to another state, but we still keep in touch, and out of the blue, Kyle's wife hits me up on the book of faces. We talk about how life has been and whatnot, where we live and such. Turns out she's just down the street from me. We keep talking every so often when she texts one day asking for a favor. I'm not working that day and bored out of my mind, so I oblige and run a pack of smokes down to her since she's out and can't get more because of her kid. I get to her apartment and we hang out for a bit talking. We head out to the patio for a cigarette and in the daylight her shirt is almost completely see-through. I make an offhand comment about it and without a second thought she pulls it off. We go back inside and go to town on each other on her and Kyle's bed. We keep the affair going a few weeks, then just kind of stop. At this point, I felt my revenge was complete. I had this guy's wife on his bed, and he won't know till they get into another huge fight. I wipe my hands of the drama and go about my day. Fast forward another few years, my band had just finished a huge show before we went on tour, and as I'm doing the meet and greet thing at our merch booth, I get a Facebook message from Kyle, before the quarantine non-friend messages. Kyle was in the hospital. He said it was serious and had a question. Did you ever spend time with Hannah? I'm looking at this text, thinking of all the ways I could mess with his head, but decided to probe a little by saying, I think that's something you should ask her first. He replies, I did, and she told me something happened at our apartment. 
I need to know if it's true. So I think for a second and sent him two pictures we took, one of her giving me a present and one of the aftermath. He just replies, thanks, and blocked me. I think good, now the jerk knows what it feels like and go about my merry. But this story isn't done yet, friendos, not by a long shot. See, unbeknownst to me, Hannah and Kyle had another kid around nine months after our affair, and it wasn't Kyle's. From the pictures, it was obvious that we didn't use protection, so he immediately suspected it was mine. Hannah knew better since she was already pregnant when we started, but just barely. Kyle viewed me as his enemy ever since high school because I stole all of his friends. So knowing that he was raising the child of someone he hated just burned him up inside. He turned to hard drugs and became a raging alcoholic, tried to get information on where I lived, and kept trying to get revenge on me for all of this, but failed miserably. Lost his job, his family, what few longtime friends he had. Basically, his life just crashed around him. About two years ago, I reconnected with another ex from high school, and she told me the aftermath. What Kyle tried to do, what ended up happening to his life. Hannah took him for everything in their divorce. Last I heard, he's locked up for robbing a liquor store while carrying methamphetamines, and a loaded pistol which landed him in for about 12 years. I know the whole point is nuclear revenge, and I would agree that it is nuclear revenge, but is there actually any, like, right person in this story? You might be able to argue that one person's a little more right than the other in this situation, but I feel like the collective actions as a whole, probably just a bit of all around being a jerk. I don't know, cheating on me? Get HIV then. This is not my story, I just saw this on Facebook and thought it might fit here. So the story belongs to a Chinese man, I'll just translate it. I've suffered for at least six months. Finally, I can push her into the darkest pit of heck. It's a long story, so let me light up a cigarette and tell you all about it. I met my girlfriend when we were on the same vacation tour back in 2006. The first time our eyes met, I made a promise to myself that I have to make her my girlfriend. The process wasn't hard by any means. I just poured my truest, deepest love out to her to make her moved by my true feelings. I loved her. I truly, really loved her. But due to my job, I had to travel a lot. Sometimes I would be away from home for 15 days to a month. About six months ago, I noticed she had been showing signs of a cheater. She'd always try to hide away from me when she was on her phone, either if she was texting or calling someone. I'd just lay my eyes on her phone and she would turn it off. I could almost confirm that she was cheating, but I didn't have any kind of evidence. I have an email account that had been logged in for a good while but rarely used, and then one day, there were hotel bills sent to this email. I checked the emails and some other things, and found out there were some note lines about the bills. After that, there was nothing left to clarify. But one man's soul can't truly die when he wasn't dead. Me and some friends found out about the man she'd been screwing with, and the hotel's location. The first thing I felt when her cheating on me was confirmed was anger. I was furious, not a bit of heartbreaking. It's the feeling when you wanted someone to die, gone, disappeared. I wanted her to suffer and disappear. So reality has proved that money can solve anything. I found a way to contact the other man, his WeChat, it's like Facebook for Chinese, to be exact. I have friends that are really, really talented, smart people if I could tell. I made friends with a doctor back in August last year. I told him my story and what was my plan, and also sprinkled in a bit of, you can have the benefit out of this too, of course I'll pay the money. He made up his mind for a few days, and then gave me contacts of some female patients that have HIV. There was no mention about the strict policy in the hospital about patients' privacy. Out of three patients I've met, only one agreed. Most of the ones who have HIV haven't had a clean life. When you have the money, you can really control the devil himself. I gave her the other man's contact and an amount of fee and required her in the shortest time she could to give him HIV. This modern life made it really easy for a woman to sleep with a man. It only took her five days. I worried that one night wasn't enough for him to catch it, so I asked her to be his friends with benefits for a while and gave her around 2,150 US dollars. My girlfriend still hasn't known anything. She did really fall for him. I knew it since reading her texts. About two weeks before that, she had a fever. 
a terrible, agonizing fever. We did hook up, but I used protection. I told her to go to the hospital, but due to my job, I had to be away for several days, so I couldn't make it to the hospital with her. I would pay a fortune to see her face when she found out about the HIV, though. After two days, I went home and saw her being upset and all, and then after asking my friend at the hospital, it was confirmed that she had HIV. I was ecstatic, but I played it cool. I was the dumb boyfriend that hadn't known anything. She didn't know that I already got the info about her HIV. We're still being together for now. I want to witness with my own eyes her being slowly passing on the hospital bed. That's all. If anything's happened, I'll tell you later. So considering the story that I just read here, would you guys agree with me in hoping that this story is actually fake and not real? Also, unfortunately for this person, despite their attempt at... Well, ending their ex-partner. Nowadays, HIV is actually extremely treatable, so it's not very likely that they're going to, you know, kick the bucket anytime soon. As far as the story goes though, would you agree with me that you hope this story was fake? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is from Sanity Contagion. Years of drunken abuse result in a blanket party. My aunt was an intensive care nurse at a hospital in Texas for 30 years. This is her story. A while back, my aunt tells me and my cousins this story, probably as a warning about drinking, I guess. For years, Mrs. Smith would come into my aunt's ER battered and bruised, apparently sometimes quite severely. The woman was getting up there in years and had almost monthly visits that sometimes required her to stay for a week or more. A quick rundown of some of the injuries I recall broken pelvis, explained by falling down the stairs in her one-story home, broken arms, wrists, explained as falling out of her car, a shattered orbital bone in her eye socket, no explanation I can recall, a series of broken ribs, various excuses. Lastly, this jerk broke her back, which required fusing three of her vertebrae. Driveway car accident. So Mr. Smith is appropriately qualified as a total piece of crap. On the end of my aunt's 12-hour shift, the call comes in from the ambulance that they're bringing in a 70-year-old Smith. Faces fell, everyone gets somber knowing that Mrs. Smith probably won't survive the night due to the years of beating she's already endured. The ER calls the ambulance back asking for a description of the injuries so the OR can be somewhat prepared. What they heard on the radio pissed everyone off. The paramedics were completely unprofessional. They were laughing their butts off as they described broken arm, broken leg, and lacerated scalp. When the ambulance pulls up, my aunt and several other ER staff are trying to read them the riot act. Instead, Mrs. Smith primly stepped out of the ambulance. The paramedics pull the stretcher out of the ambulance and wheel her husband inside. Enough is enough. Apparently, that's all she said. The paramedics had to fill in the rest of the story. So, here it is. Mr. Smith came home drunk one last time, and she wrapped him in a blanket and beat him with a cast iron frying pan. Mr. and Mrs. Smith never came back to the ER. Maybe he learned. Honestly, I sincerely hope that he did learn. It's honestly almost a little saddening that, after all this that happened from both sides, that in the end they still go home together. I just hope things were better for Mrs. Smith after that point. I mean, not showing up to the ER doesn't necessarily mean nothing happened. I guess really all we can do is just hope that everything worked out in the best for Mrs. Smith after that point. Maybe literally she beat some sense into her husband. By the way, if you're enjoying these stories, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. Every video has awesome stories, like our final story of the day from YL0K. Won't pay me for my work? I will ruin your business from the inside. For some context, this all happened to me just over a year ago. After telling the story to multiple people, some of my close friends told me that it would be appreciated here. To begin, I moved to the US from Germany about 5 years ago. My father found a steady job as an insurance salesman, and my mother was a housewife for the first couple of years, living in the United States. At this time, I was only 12 years old and attempting to find friends in my 6th grade class. After about 3 years of living in a calm suburban town, my mother had become more increasingly bored as a stay-at-home mom, and she decided to start looking for a job. 
Eventually, she found a job translating for a new small options company based in the big city near my suburb. Her boss and CEO was probably the most narcissistic, arrogant jerk I've ever met, so we'll call him DB for D-bag. In addition to translating conversations, emails, and documents from foreign clients, she was also in charge of building the company's new website and managing all the docs and programs they had made. About a year later, after I turned 16, I was looking for a job and I eventually started working for my mom's boss and his company because they were looking for employees and I was looking for employment. When I started there, I was put in charge of the website management because I knew a lot more about technology and computer stuff than my mother did. Before I continue further, I would like to explain a little more about D-Bag's company. So basically what his company does is create resources and tutorials for people who are learning about trading options or stocks, and their lessons weren't cheap. Clients varied in wealth, we had some very rich, and others looking for deals on a budget. This is important to the story. Anyway, I wasn't paid an hourly salary for my job with DB's company. I was paid a predetermined amount per task that I completed. It worked pretty well at first. DB would assign me a task to complete, and we would agree on a price for my time. Most of the tasks were tedious busy work no one in the office wanted to do. DB and I had only met in person a few times, and we mostly talked through emails. As with school, most of my work with the company was done on my computer at home. For a few months, everything went smoothly, and I made a decent amount of money for a kid my age. I didn't mind doing the work, as it was very simple, just tedious, and I could watch YouTube while working at home, which was a win-win for me. Eventually, there came a time when I was paid a little less than what we agreed on. However, I noticed, but didn't really care, as I was still making a lot of money. I thought it was just a mistake on his end, but I was wrong. After completing more tasks, he started paying me less and less than what we previously had agreed on. When I eventually confronted him about it, he argued with me and said that he'd paid me the amount we'd agreed on, which I knew was a complete lie. There was even a time where he didn't even pay me at all. I was so sick of his crap. He kept making excuses about how I'm just a kid and I don't need to pay taxes or anything and he just went on and on. At this point, the only reason I still worked for this jerk was solely to get revenge. About a month later, I get a very important email from DB explaining that a new client just made a very expensive order and bought a copy of almost every course, document and lesson that DB had for sale. My task was to revise all the documents in his order and create a folder to locate copies of all the resources. Like I said, it was easy work, but time consuming and everyone else had something more important to do. I told DB that I would start immediately and I would have the folder ready by the end of the week. However, this was a lot of work and I wasn't sure if DB was even going to pay me so I didn't do anything. By the end of the week, my inbox is exploding from emails from DB frantically asking about the folder. I said that I was really busy the whole week with school, but DB wasn't having it. He lost a client that he could have made tens of thousands of dollars off of. He called my phone, and when I answered, he started screaming at me and said I wouldn't be paid for my work, which I probably wouldn't have been anyway, and I was fired on the spot. I honestly didn't really care, as at this point, I really knew how much of a jerk DB was. I thought I was done with him, but sadly, I wasn't. DB then began harassing my mother at work, physically and mentally. I witnessed this when I went to visit the office with her. She eventually quit, but I knew I had to get back at DB once and for all, and I wanted him to really suffer this time. What DB didn't know was that I still had access to the website and I was an admin. I had access to all the resources of the company that they sold. Slowly I started to formulate my plan, and a great idea came to me. Disclaimer, I'm not sure if what I did here is illegal, but I know that DB deserved this. When clients approached our website, they filled out their email address or phone number. What I did was when a new client contacted me through the website, I contacted them with a fake email, and I gave them every resource they asked for, for free. This went on for months, and when DB heard the news that there had been zero new clients in months, it shattered him. He actually became depressed. At this point, it made me so happy to see him like this, and I knew I had to take it a step further. I began reaching out to regular clients too, 
and giving them all the company lessons and docs for free too. This was a small company, and it didn't take long. Pretty soon, the company started to go under, as they had zero sales for almost a whole quarter. After DB's company went under, his wife divorced him, and he was left unemployed living off his savings, which hopefully won't last him very long. I don't know all the details about what happened to DB after his company shut down, but I do know that his future isn't very bright at the moment, and he's a depressed alcoholic. The best part is that he will never know that it was me, and seeing the closed sign in front of his old office building every day makes me smile. I mean, frankly, a person like this who was running their business to be a jerk, literally abusing their employees, trying to steal money from kids, their work probably wasn't even the greatest of quality anyways. I don't think they really deserve to have that business, or at least have one that was flourishing. An awful person like that who's willing to go and do that to their own employees is basically asking for their whole operation to blow up when everybody leaves because who's going to work through that? Unless that's your last ditch effort and you need the money. I think what OP did here is fair game, even if in the legal eye it might not be the most legal thing. I don't necessarily think it's probably too legal to go and just hand out a company's internal documents like that. But honestly, DB probably wouldn't spend the money to go after OP anyways. But first, we have a story of getting back at an awful two-faced manager. I'm equal parts mortified and equal parts relieved to be reliving this rather dramatic time in my life. But my best friend dared me to do it, and I've been chicken enough in my life, so here goes. When I was 25, I'm 29 now, I worked in this really hippie type event planning slash marketing company, and I was employed under the design and content marketing extension of the company. And although we were seven, my team was a close-knit group. You know, the sort of team to hang out on Fridays after work and invite each other for kickbacks over the weekend. The team was fun and the atmosphere was vibrant, so naturally I absolutely loved it. I was working as a graphic designer slash content creator for the company, so my workload was quite the pile as you would imagine, but it was never something that made me want to puke at the thought of going to work the next day. To sum it up, my life was somewhere close to perfect, or at least as I could be content with, until she stepped into it and messed everything up. About 8 months after I got employed at the company, my line manager resigned because he got a better offer and we were all heartbroken. But he had to leave for better opportunities, and we all understood. In fact, at some point, I was looking forward to the new manager because I'd heard that she was a woman, and I was super excited to see how the dynamics of working directly with a female boss would be, considering that our top management and founders were all men. But my expectations were definitely too high, and I didn't realize that until much, much, much later. Anyway, let me get back to the gist of the story. A week after B officially left the company, we met the new manager. Let's call her L because she's the world's biggest loser. L got to know everyone pretty quickly, and we would later learn that she devoted so much effort into getting to know us because she wanted to be able to exploit individual weaknesses. L had been working with us for a month, no drama, no worries, and just a ton of questions and criticism. But then came the first quarterly review meeting with her as a manager. So here's a little explainer about our quarterly meetings. At the company, we had three CEOs, two were co-founders, while one was more of a CFO than a CEO. The two co-founders were quite annoying because they were more or less investors who had bought the idea for the company and funded it with professionals without truly understanding the details. And B had been a buffer for us at these quarterly meetings because he prepped us for loopholes they may try to poke at to audit our performance, and he was good at highlighting all the work we were doing right. I'm not saying we were slackers, but the co-founders are notorious micromanagers, and it could be a maze to try and draw their attention to the true objective of our work as opposed to whatever they assume we should have been looking out for. B was the one who could field their million and one questions and emphasize that our work had met the required standards for the month as opposed to whatever BS they decided in the moment was to be our focus. And this usually helped our individual reviews at the end of the meeting because the CEOs couldn't find anything to indicate his bad quality. The only reasonable person on the main board was the CEO CFO guy and because he was an employee at the end of the day. There wasn't much he could do but roll his eyes and sigh along with us when one of the evil twins, as my team called the co-founders, mentioned something redundant. So anyway, back to L's first blow with the team. 
We were at the first quarterly meeting with the CEOs and she must have gotten the gist that the co-founders had money, but didn't get the gist that they had more money than common sense. When they started shooting questions at us about the Thanksgiving and Halloween events and content we were pushing out, one of them actually said that we should try to infuse monochromatic pastel designs into the Thanksgiving bits. Everyone started the usual dance of looking at each other, sighing and subtly rolling eyes, but L, under some misguided impression that they were right, turned to me and said, That's what I said, isn't it? I must have looked as confused as I felt, because she started snapping her fingers in front of my face and I had to ask her to repeat herself. Of course, she didn't take that kindly, and then she went on and on about how she had the idea for pastel Thanksgiving and neutral tone Halloween designs, but that I and the rest of the team had disagreed with her. Never mind that those were the exact ideas that Dumbo number one had just spat on the table. Even the CEO slash CFO had the wildest look on his face because he knew that the team's performance as a whole hinged on the manager's direction. But she definitely made the co-founders happy. After all, they were used to B's constant defense, and L was positively glowing in their praise. After the CEOs left the meeting, L turned to us and said, Those two are not the brightest bulbs, right guys? And everyone just stared in total silence. Like, what just actually happened? But she either didn't pick up on the mood of the room, or she just didn't care because, in the next breath, she started the team quarterly meeting and was praising us in the worst way possible. Seriously, I kid you not, she was commending our efforts with the sindest, rude remarks. It felt like a whiplash because the first month hadn't really been intense, and we were halfway through her second month of the company without so much as a complaint. But suddenly it was... Good job, Stacy. but if you need to replenish your creative juice, just let me know and we can brainstorm better ideas because this isn't all that. One hour later and the absurd meeting was over, but the drama had just started. Our monthly performance reviews came in after the quarterly meeting, and while I hadn't thought about it, I wasn't surprised to find a note stating that there was a 15% drop in my performance rating from the previous quarter, alongside a comment about insubordination. It was Elle's remark during the meeting that caused it, and I was certain of it. But I didn't want to be a pot stirrer simply because someone was trying to find their footing within the company. And the next month, my performance review was unaffected, but someone else's was. Actually, three people. And because we'd spoken about it in a private group chat, we all knew who was behind it. Elle, the new manager. So the three of them did what I wasn't able to do. They went to her and complained about her remarks on their performance reviews which were point-blank false. And she listened to them and told them that it was probably just a misunderstanding. But she knew what she was doing, and by the next morning, all three of them had queries from the HR. Elle told the HR that they were questioning her authority unfairly and trying to make her align with the former manager's, B's, ideals. She mentioned how one of them was skipping out on work. He was taking night classes and skip days for tests, but the mistake he made was telling her, and she said that she thought heavy medication was affecting another's performance. Poor girl has PCOS. Of course, her reasons were BS, but she CC'd the CEO in the email. And because she was practically the teacher's pet at that point, a minimal investigation was demanded and HR had to take action on the query immediately. It ended in the unpaid suspension of the three of them for a week. Crap got real fast. There we were, having to pick up the slack for three key members of the team and wondering which of us would be the next target for the devious manager. Telling her about our personal lives was the first mistake, but underestimating how devious she could be was the biggest mistake. Two months after the quarterly meeting that started the whole thing, we had an in-house pitch presentation for the top management in view of one major client that was considering us for a long-term project. I was headlining the pitch because of the nature of the project, and I'd created the pitch deck with input from our marketing and primary content persons. I got up to the projector, did my thing, got approving nods from my team members and the CFO, and surprisingly, the evil twins didn't look like they had a lot to add or they were probably bored. But when Elle noticed that the co-founders were not throwing endless and meaningless questions, she stood up. And that is the idea I gave the team to work with. Thank you for that presentation. I'll handle any questions. The room was silent. Er, um, what? I had no words to respond with. I was still in a shocked daze when I took my seat. And in the next minute or so, 
The co-founders were cheering for Elle and praising her efforts as a great leader for letting me present the pitch. And I was staring a hole in her head, but she was doing everything to ignore me. Until the meeting ended, of course. The evil twins told Elle that she would be joining them to pitch to the client in a few weeks. And she was smiling like a Cheshire cat through it all. My team members all looked at me with pity, but they understood what the implication for challenging her would be. When I got home from work, I ranted to my best friend, and just like she pushed me to talk about this, she pushed me to confront Elle. So I asked for a meeting with Elle. I explained that I understood that she needed time to adjust to the dynamics of the company, but I would appreciate it if she stopped undermining my work and that of the other team members. And she all but laughed in my face. Sweetheart, I know you feel like you got cheated out of this presentation like your boyfriend cheated on you. I sucked in a breath and steeled my stomach because that was a hard blow, but I knew she wasn't done. But you need to understand that the more I look good to those idiots at the top, the better for the team. It's just the way things work. And I went back to work, and it continued like that for another two months. The team would put in work for something, she would wait to see the evil twins reaction, and then swoop in to steal the shine or throw someone away under the bus. But when it came to a performance review for my promotion, I knew I couldn't let things go as they were. I needed a great shot for an upward review of my salary, but I knew I couldn't get it if she was still adamant on blocking my progress and that of the rest of the team. So, I spoke to my best friend about it, and she convinced me that the best thing to do was to knock Elle off her game. And I knew I couldn't tell the rest of my team because everyone was trying to protect their positions. Meanwhile, I knew that I was either getting a promotion or getting the heck out of there. My revenge plan was set, and I knew it was only a matter of time. Elle liked sucking up to the CEOs, but she liked trolling them even better. So I waited till the next time we had a meeting with them and approached her after the meeting. My phone was set to record in my pants. I started with a harmless remark about the meeting and she took it as the opening. Sometimes I wonder who gave these two idiots the money to make such decisions. Over the next few weeks, I started these kinds of conversations with her, recording every time she made a snide comment and waiting for the perfect chance for my bullseye shot. But I knew Elle was smart, so I decided to go for a long shot. I came up with a document containing screenshots of text where she had insulted the CEOs and added some empty gibberish text to a different document. She was lazy, except for when she was throwing everyone else on the ground to make her way to the top. So I knew she wouldn't spare a long glance at the document. I waited for her to be in a heated discussion with one of the team members and brought the gibberish doc to her. Hi L, I need this authorized for an update to the milestones on the project. She took a single look at the bold heading, flipped the pages mindlessly, signed and dated the document, and went back to berating the designer she was speaking to. I immediately scanned her signature, placed it on a version of the document without the gibberish text, and sent it off to the CEOs. I attached the audio recordings of her snide remarks and waited for heck to let loose. About 30 minutes later, I heard a repeated, no, 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 from her office. And while my team members peeked their heads out to look at what was going on, I was trying hard not to laugh in my cubicle. By the next day, the CEO stopped by for a quick chat with L and the head of HR. When they verified her signature and voice on the recordings, they suspended her indefinitely. I came clean to the team and encouraged them to tell HR about L's behavior. Our explanations confirmed their suspicion. Most of them had worked with us while B was around, and they mentioned that the co-founders wouldn't have done anything about her incompetency if it hadn't become clear that she was disrespecting them. But the underdogs won, and she was fired at the end of that week. I didn't get promoted, but I got the satisfaction of watching her pack up her office with security looking over her shoulder the entire time. And all was well in my world once again. Also, I got a job offer at the firm that B moved to, which was the perfect ending to the very dramatic turn of events in my professional life. Do you guys think the story stands as proof that if you're going to make yourself look super good to the bosses, but you're actually behind their backs, trashing them, trashing the people you work with, etc., that eventually at some point you're going to slip up and it's going to make you pay? Or would you think it's possible for people like this to stick around for a long time, maybe an entire career, doing this awful two-faced stuff? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. 
And by the way, if you're enjoying these stories, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. Every video has awesome stories, like our final story of the day, Revenge Against My Scum of the Earth Father. Just one thing before you start reading this, I have no remorse about what I did and how I did it. My only regret is that I waited so long to do it. My mother loved me and I loved her, and we both hated my father, at least for as long as I can remember. But the villain in the story is actually not my dad. I think it's the universe because I can't believe how unfortunate my mother and I were to be related or involved with someone like him. But I'm jumping the gun a bit, let me take it back a bit. The first time my dad hit me, I was 10 years old and it was my birthday. I know this sounds heavily cinematic, but there's a level of BS that you go through in life that everything else pales in comparison. And I went through 9 rings of this heck. My mother baked a cake. I was so psyched and I had friends over. My baby brother was 4 years old and getting in everyone's way, but it wasn't an issue then. Later it would be the biggest trigger. Why did I get hit? Well, my dad was sitting in his office drinking his regular bottle of beer, grooming a drinking problem I was too young to recognize. I went in to give him a slice of my birthday cake, but I tripped and the cake splashed on his rug and shoes. Before I could stand up and apologize, he slapped me so hard that I felt my neck snap. I couldn't process what happened, and before I came to, he had locked his office door and I was standing in the hallway with tears on my face. That's how my mom found me. The next time my dad hit me, I was 13 and he'd lost his job. I had the unfortunate luck, story of my life, to have been the first person to enter the house after he had been fired for inappropriate conduct at work, as I would later find out. And the fact that I was smiling as I locked the door behind myself was too much for him, so he slapped me and dragged my shirt to the room I shared with my 7 year old brother. He locked me in there for the rest of the day, and it was when my mom got back that she opened the door. You're probably wondering what my mom told me the first time he hit me. Well, it was the same thing she said the second time, and every other time for the next four years. Your dad's dealing with things we don't really understand. Just stay out of his way and you'll be alright. So the abuse continued, and I tried my best to stay out of his way and keep my younger brother out of his way. But two years later, when I was 15, he hit me and he hit my brother too. What did we do? Well, our baby brother, who was barely six months at this time, was crying and he couldn't sleep after a long day of searching for a way to feed the family, which was basically drunk speak for a day of drinking. Anyway, the baby was crying, my younger brother was playing with trucks, and he couldn't stand the noise. So he brought his belt to our room and gave my younger brother two whips. He gave me 20 because I dared to pull the trembling 9 year old away from him. I bled from gashes in my back that night and although I was old enough to question it, I was still the kid who wanted to help my mother by simply staying out of his way. So I told my younger brother what she told me and stuck him out to get ice cream and avoid pissing the man off even further. At that point, I was certain that he wasn't my dad, not in the way that mattered. A week later, I realized that it was worse than I thought. I was turning 16 and excited that I would be able to work and help my mother out. She was doing two shifts at three jobs and getting back at 10pm every day with a baby that was exhausted from crying all day and barely holding herself upright. The owner of the grocery store at the corner had promised to employ me when I turned 16 and I was so close to it that I had an extra skip in my step, so you can't really blame me for not picking up the signs as soon as I got back from school. But now that I think back on it, I should have noticed that my mom's keys were in the key holder when she should have been at work, and the house reeked of alcohol so that meant my father was home too. But none of that registered until I heard my mother shout. I ran to their bedroom door but it was locked and the familiar sounds of his belt and her screams were all I needed to know. A few minutes later she stepped out and I knew she wasn't expecting me to be home. That night, after we stepped out to meet with friends and my baby brother went over to the neighbor's place to play. She grabbed my youngest brother, the toddler, and we went to a diner and she spilled her guts all over the table between us. She told me about the first time he hit her, shortly after they got married and had me. Then she apologized for all the mornings when she stayed in bed extra late and I had to make breakfast and get my brother ready for school and look after the toddler. She was fixing whatever obvious injury she had to make sure I wouldn't ask questions. 
Over and over, she kept talking about how I was such a good boy and how I did so well to help her out and she knew I was excited about starting the job at the grocery store and blah blah blah. As shocking as her revelation was, I didn't think anything could have been worse than watching that man whip my baby brother. So we went back home after about two hours. He wasn't back yet, and that made everything feel a little better. And that was the beginning of a new routine in my life. My mom would stay longer in bed on some days, and I would tell my very curious younger brother that she was exhausted from working so hard. And when he asked why daddy wasn't working as hard, I would tell him that daddy was doing his best. But while I worked and studied to get to that point, I was shielding my brothers from the physical and emotional abuse, doing extra of my mom's part to prevent my brothers from being neglected in the worst way possible. And it worked. At first it did anyway. I got promoted at the grocery store, went to community college, and started my own little lawn mowing and landscaping business with just myself, my close friend, and my brother doing the tasks. Well, my brother was more of an assistant than anything, but anywhere was better than having him stay at the house for longer than necessary with the man. But I was living a double life because, as an adult, it became clearer to me that my mom saw me as a crutch, and if she had full access to all I was doing and how much I was making, I would have to fund the man's lifestyle. I apologize if this gets dark, but you must know that this man was the scum that gave birth to all the scum on earth. And I'm really trying not to get into the specifics of what he did so that I don't trigger people with dealing with PTSD about this stuff. When he was employed, the man's drinking made him mean. When he was poor, his drinking made him worse than the devil. And by the time I was 20, I had enough credits to finish college in a year. And my business got an investment offer. One of the old men I frequently helped out cleared a check from his pension and wanted to help me. But I knew scaling wouldn't be easy if we were still living with the man. But for the first time, fate was in my favor. Seven years after he lost his job and failed at everything relating to a productive life, my alcoholic father finally completed the cycle of deadbeat dadness. He up and left, but he took everything with him. Literally. I got a call right after one of my finals, and it was my 14-year-old brother calling to tell me that he couldn't find our 5-year-old brother. I was making enough to help mom with the younger kids, but she still held down multiple jobs so she could handle all the house-related things and not cause suspicion from the man. So our five-year-old brother had a simple rule. If he was left alone at home, he was to lock the door and not open it for anyone till he heard any of our voices. And he was a pretty obedient kid, so I knew something was off right off the bat. I told my younger brother to call the cops, but also check the back of the house, in case the kid had wandered off due to boredom. I raced home and found my younger brother in tears. Long story short, the man had cleared out the house, save for a few of our clothing and documents, but everything else was gone. By the time my mom got home, it was no longer an assumption but a fact. He had robbed us and skipped town. The cops were naturally furious at my mom and threatened to call CPS, but I intervened and said that I was responsible for the missing kid, because she had informed me about her schedule and I promised to look after him. I didn't see any reason why my mom should have to deal with losing most of her items and having to be separated from her children, which is exactly what would have happened if the cops knew the full details. Later that night, as we huddled in front of the house, after hours of searching for my youngest brother, The kid turned up at the house. He had run out of the house when the man came and started screaming for some men to take everything, and he was scared that they were going to take him. So, he hid in our neighbor's garage, but slept off and was only found when our neighbor was trying to park his car. That was one crisis averted, and I saw the man's theft as a blessing in disguise. I could focus on rebuilding our lives, and I was determined enough to achieve it, and I did. I got the first investment and more kept rolling in, and my life went on an upward rise from there. My mother died about two years after the man stole all our possessions. She was hit by a drunk driver and didn't survive, so I became the legal guardian of my brothers and I moved them out of the house with haunted memories. Anyway, to the revenge bit. I turned 30 earlier this year and I currently employ 20 young people with similar backgrounds at my landscaping company. My life's pretty good right now, but it got even better when I was on an out-of-state trip a few months ago to meet a client, and I saw the man cuddling up to a pile of trash near the outskirts of the state I was visiting. 
He was almost unrecognizable, but you don't really forget an abuser's face. So I had no issues identifying him. And aside from my first thought of trash remaining trash, I knew he had to pay for what he did to my entire life and to the people I loved. But I didn't want to get tied up in anything unnecessarily criminal. I have two young men that I'm responsible for. So I called up an old client that was so insufferable, even female staff members refused to work with her. I told her a situation with a bum that needed some work, but wouldn't mind no pay as long as he got some food. But I knew she was truly a vile person who always tried to convince my staff to accept less pay than they deserve, so it felt only right that the man should work tirelessly for someone so ruthless. I got one of my close friends to approach him, I couldn't risk getting recognized, and offer him the job. An alcoholic with no job, family, house, or possessions? Of course he jumped at the opportunity. And every day I intentionally drove by my former client's house. The look of utter dejection on his face filled with a dark urge in my mind. I was getting ready to leave him to whatever treatment she gave him, but then, like a nasty rash, he wouldn't leave my existence. He fell ill and slumped because she had him do some work on her second floor windows while it was raining, and of course, she didn't want to be responsible for him. She threatened to report him to the cops, but I didn't want him to get charged with a misdemeanor and end up without any actual suffering, so I told her to drop him off at an elite hospital and that it would be best if she mentioned that he was a stranger she picked up on the road and left no personal information behind, except my number in place of hers just so I could confirm that he was admitted to the hospital. To be honest, this rant slash spill slash recap has spent a long time in my drafts, but I finally got a word from the hospital last week, aka they called to inform me that the initial tests showed a possible tumor and they wanted to confirm my contact information, to which I promptly denied with a strong wrong number, so it felt like the time was right to clear this off my mind and clear him off my life. He'll be coherent in a few days, maybe, and be able to tell him his personal information, or whatever remains alcohol hasn't soaked up, and I would be none the wiser while he gets caught up in an endless string of debts. I know they say revenge is best served cold, but I didn't expect that a literal cold from the rain would help me. He hurt my loved ones, and now he's going to drown in a sea of debt, or whatever to be honest. I lost all feeling for him when I lost my mother, and I just want to build my business and help my brothers enjoy a life I couldn't. This overall did culminate in a really good revenge, but in a way it's almost a disappointing commentary on the US healthcare system. At least I'm assuming this took place in the US. Like the fact that this guy got sick, ended up in the hospital, and ended up having a tumor being the reason that this guy is going to end up with an endless string of debts because he's homeless is really, when you take a step back, just a disappointing realization of the American healthcare system in general. I mean, it's good revenge, it's the kind of thing a guy like that deserves, you know, struggling, broke, endless debts. But the fact alone that it was them having a tumor and getting medical assistance being the reason that he just instantly accrues this endless debt, in a way it's almost disappointing. Our Revenger got her stalker police officer imprisoned and got rid of her bullying neighbor at the same time. There's a lot of moving parts to the story, and I'll try not to lose anyone along the way. I'm a female in my late 20s, and this story took place a while ago. Let me start by saying that I was no angel growing up. My parents were very religious and cared a lot about what people thought of them. I, on the other hand, had a habit of taking things that didn't belong to me because I wanted them and my parents wouldn't get it for me. I was first arrested when I was 12 for shoplifting. I have something of a sweet tooth. One day I was trying to stuff some chocolate bars in my pants while in a store and this shadow just appeared over me. The next thing I knew, these huge hands went into my pants and pulled out the chocolate bars. This was my first encounter with Officer Squarejaw. He was about twice my age at the time and looked like he was the mold they made marines from. He convinced the store owner not to press charges and I was let go with a warning. I immediately learned my lesson and decided to change my tactics to more distant targets. I was 16 the next time I was arrested, this time it was for fraud. I got a fake ID and used it to get a job in a bar where I was skimming credit cards and using them to buy stuff. Officer Squarejaw just happened to be in the bar one night and caught me. This time I didn't get a warning. 
I was sent to juvenile detention or youth detention as they like to call it these days. Being locked up with a bunch of teenage girls is a lot like high school combined with a sleepover you can never leave. I was always kind of a loner. I wasn't really strong. In fact, I was actually very timid. So I was fish food from the jump. And I got jumped. Going through that on a nearly daily basis completely broke me. I know what you're thinking. She probably deserved it. Stealing from others is bad. And you know what? I agree with you. What I did was wrong and I deserved every moment of heck for the two years I was inside. I was a selfish person and I'm sure I hurt a lot of people with my stealing. I was alone for those two years because my parents couldn't handle the shame of a child in prison. They left town as soon as the judge banged the gavel. The person I spent the most time with in juvie was also the one who beat me the worst. We'll call her the Dean because she ran the center. The Dean was hardcore. She used to brag about how she had boyfriends all over town and separate phones for each one so they wouldn't find out about each other. When I got out, my real nightmare began. My parents wanted nothing to do with me after I went in, so I wasn't expecting anyone to be there to pick me up. But there he was, Officer Squarejaw. He was pushing 30 now, and time did nothing to mellow him out. He even came in his patrol car to take me back to town. After everything I'd been through the past two years, I was too scared to refuse a ride with him. He made me ride in the back because of regulations or something, civilians can't sit in the front. The entire drive to town, he kept telling me how he wants to look out for me, that him arresting me was for my own good, and that now he'll take care of me, make sure that I stay on the right path. When we got to town, he dropped me off in front of a diner that was his aunt's, and that he arranged with her to give me a job that I should start earning an honest living. The truth was, I was done with stealing, with crime in general. I just wanted to be left alone, which is why I didn't want to stay in the halfway house, and that meant getting my own place, and that meant getting a job. The town I lived in wasn't big, but it wasn't small either. Everybody didn't know each other, but you didn't need to ask a lot of people before finding somebody who knew you. In a town like mine, that means it's hard to keep a low profile once people start thinking you're a criminal. And since I was desperate for a job, I went into the diner and told his aunt I was there to work. In some way, I was relieved and grateful for the second chance. But Squarejaw still scared me. To her credit, the diner owner was a decent person, unlike her nephew. She hired me as a waitress because she said I had a pretty face. I don't remember anyone ever saying that to me before. She paid me fairly, which was completely unexpected, so I was really grateful. I worked hard, and eventually I was able to afford a place to rent. Squarejaw didn't want anything at first. He just hung around the diner when he was on lunch, and insisted on taking me home after my shift if he was around, always in the backseat. He made sure to drop me off in front of my apartment building and watch me go in. It wasn't a fancy place or anything. I could have afforded a slightly nicer place if I wanted to, even on my paycheck, but I was saving up my money for when my probation was over so that I could leave town. Up until that point, the ride home was the worst thing I had to deal with, which made what happened when I got home seem worse. My neighbors were nice people. I don't think they knew about me, and if they did, they pretended like they didn't. Their daughter, let's call her Miniskirt, she was one of those attractive girls who were also attracted to violence. She and her friends made the one flight of stairs to my apartment seem like an eternity. Some days there'd be no one at the top, and I'd just go into my apartment. Other days, she and her friends would be there and they'd either trip me or push me when no one was looking, and if people were around, they'd whisper horrible things at me. Things they would do to me or get their guy friends to do to me. It was like they could smell the weakness in me. The worst part of it all was they were younger than me. Miniskirt was only 15. I don't know what was worse, the fear of being bullied or the shame that I was older than them. After a while, things with Officer Squarejaw started escalating. It seemed weird at first and didn't make sense. On the rides home, he would ask me random but oddly specific questions. He'd say like, how was the cheese flavored two minute noodles? You shouldn't eat so many Oreos because it'll affect your figure. It only clicked when specifically mentioning the brand of tampons I was using and asking if they were what worked best for me. I never told him any of these details, and I never went shopping with him. I later realized that he was going through my trash. We had communal bins outside the apartment, 
and I threw my trash away late at night because I didn't want to run into anyone. One night, after I realized that he'd been going through my trash, I saw his personal car was parked down the street and it had a view of the trash bins. I recognized his car because he'd picked me up from home a few times on the way to work. He also made me ride in the back because he didn't want people to get the wrong impression. Knowing that he was out there watching me made me terrified. I couldn't sleep. I would spend most nights sitting by the window near the fire escape with the lights off watching him until he left. Only after that could I fall asleep. All those nights allowed me to get to know Miniskirt really well. Unlike the Dean, she only had one phone and she didn't want her boyfriend texting her because her parents checked her phone. So she would lean out of the window of her room and have these loud whisper phone calls with him. Apparently it was easier to delete a phone call than a whole night's worth of texts. It didn't take long to figure out who he was. We'll call him Kix. Kix and I went to the same high school. He was the same age as me. And the two of them were very intimate. I mean, all the way intimate. Some nights she would sneak out of the fire escape to go to parties with him. Things with Officer Squarejaw were getting worse. Because I was afraid to throw away my trash when he was outside, it started piling up in my apartment. I'd wait until the garbage collection was made and then I'd have to make two or three trips down to the bins. He was moody for the next few weeks after that. I was so scared in that back seat that I thought I should start throwing my garbage away like normal again. Then one day he was smiling when he picked me up and after that I wished I never hid my garbage from him. He bought me a cell phone. He said that he noticed that I don't really talk to anyone and that it wasn't healthy, that a girl my age should be texting and making friends. I didn't want friends. I didn't want anyone near me or talking to me, but how could I say no? His number was already on the phone, so when the first message came in later that night, his name on the screen made it feel like he was standing in the room with me. I didn't read any of them that night. I didn't even open them. The next day, he asked me why I didn't respond to him, and I told him I wasn't used to having a phone, so I put it on silent so that I could get some sleep. He asked me why I wasn't sleeping, and I said it was because I was having nightmares from my time away. He said if I wanted, he could park outside my place if it would make me feel safer. I told him he didn't have to do that, but he insisted that when he didn't have a night shift, he would watch over me, like I'm an idiot who didn't know he was already doing that. From then on, he would just appear wherever I was when I wasn't at home or at the diner. He had put some kind of tracking software on my phone. I was too scared to delete it because then he would know that I found it. I also didn't have anyone that I could tell about it because who was going to believe me? I eventually stopped going out except to go to work and buy groceries. I would just respond to his first few texts at night and say I need to go to bed. After a while, he started getting bolder suggesting that if I still feel unsafe that maybe he could spend the night with me a couple nights a week. He kept insisting that he was looking out for me and that all he wanted to do was protect me. I heard stories from some of the other girls inside of similar things that happened to them and how bad it got once they opened that door. I told him no as firmly as I could. He didn't like that. He said that I should think carefully about what I want in life because he is the best thing that happened to me because not even my parents wanted me. I had never been so scared in my life. The only other person that I spoke to was his aunt and she thought he was a model citizen. I had no one I could go to for help. Of course, Miniskirt decided that tormenting me at home wasn't enough. She and her friends came to the diner during my shifts. They would do things like complain that I messed up their orders, spilled their drinks, or that I was rude to them, all so that they could get free meals or discounts. All those free meals and discounts came out of my paycheck. They once even insisted that I had to pay for their dry cleaning after they spilled their drinks on it. Soon after, it completely escalated to them straight up demanding money from me. I realized that if this kept going on, I'd never have enough money to leave town and I'd be trapped there. It was like being back inside again. If I had to go through that again, I would rather end it all. This was my life for the first year after being released. One night while sitting by the window waiting for his text so I can get it over with and go to sleep, I overheard Miniskirt saying to Kix she wished that he'd paid more attention to her. And I thought to myself, you can have my problems if you want them. And suddenly, I had the dumbest idea of my life. 
All thieves are like squirrels. We want to have other people's things and we don't want other people taking our things. Every thief who's been doing it for a while has a little nest, somewhere they keep something aside. Before I was caught, I also had a little squirrel nest. I'd planned on going to it when my probation was over, on my way out of town. I meant it when I said that I was done with stealing, but apart from a little bit of money, I'd also stashed a backup card skimmer. I was going to get rid of it, I promise. One day, when I knew that Squarejaw was on patrol and couldn't follow me, I went to my nest and collected the money and the skimmer. I wore the skimmer to work under my apron, waiting for the day Mini Skirt and her friends showed up again. Mini Skirt had a prepaid credit card that she liked to pay with. It was about a week or two of waiting when they finally showed up again. I gave them my best service to avoid the free meal, and when I got her credit card, I quickly copied it on my way to the register before settling their bill. That night, I waited until she was in her room and used their Wi-Fi to buy a phone online. I know, stealing Wi-Fi is wrong. I made sure to spread the payments so that she wouldn't notice a big charge. I specifically made sure that the delivery came to their place when no one was home so that I could collect it. When I took out the phone, I wrote the number on the packaging with a note saying, Let's talk. No names. I waited until Square Jaw was outside again and Miniskirt was at home before tossing it in the garbage. I made sure that he saw me noticing him in his car when I threw it away. I also made sure that there were no fingerprints on it, just in case the creep wanted to keep it as a souvenir. When I got back to my apartment, I went to the window and watched him go to the garbage to collect the empty package. He got back into his car, and in seconds a message came through. Hey, why no names? I messaged back saying that I thought about what he said, and that he was right. I said that I wanted to take things, and because our history, I wanted to start again as if we were strangers. I mentioned how he'd known me since I was 12, and that I wanted him to think of me as a woman, and not a little girl anymore. I told him that I was going shopping soon to buy some new clothes to wear for him, if he wanted to make sure I was safe from a distance. I picked a weekend when I knew Miniskirt was also going to be at the mall. I had two reasons for wanting to go to the mall. First, I wanted Squarejaw and Miniskirt in the same place at the same time. Second, I wanted to buy some new clothes that matched some of the clothes I'd seen Miniskirt wearing when she sneaks out. I used the cash from my squirrel nest to buy the clothes. That first weekend, I walked around the mall casing out the stores that had the clothes I'd seen her wear. I also tried to follow Miniskirt a little bit because I was carrying the phone I'd bought with her card, so I wanted the phone to be near the places she went as well. I bought two or three things because I wanted to spread out the buying. Squarejaw was unsubtly following me the whole day, which explained why he was only arresting 12-year-old girls. I started to text him a lot. I kept telling him how safe he made me feel and even that when I was small I knew I needed him. During our texts on the new phone, I told Squarejaw that when we meet in person, we should act like how we always behaved until it made sense for us to be together in public. He agreed, so he'd pick me up as usual, in the back seat, and drop me off at home. Miniskirt and her crew still kept bullying me, but I could take it this time. After a few more weeks of texting and shopping, Squarejaw was starting to get impatient. He wanted more, and it was time for the next phase of my plan. This part was really tricky. I had to wait until Mini Skirt sneaked out again. I'd laid out all the clothes I bought that matched hers and would wait by the window watching and listening for when she left. The plan was to see what she was wearing, dress the same way or close to it, and then follow her to the party or wherever she went. It took almost two weeks of waiting before it happened the first time. Green skirt, pink top with orange stripes and black pumps. I put leggings on because I had at least that much self-respect, and I wore sneakers instead of pumps because I knew I wasn't getting a ride. I was dressed in a flash and out the door with my backpack before she got to the street. As I said before, the town isn't small, but it isn't that big either. There aren't that many places where teens hang out, and I'd been paying close attention everywhere I went to what the kids were saying, so I knew where they were going. Luckily it wasn't far, so I started to jog. I'd already texted Squarejaw telling him where I'd be if he wanted to see me in one of the outfits I bought for him. I got there before he did and obviously after the two lovebirds. I hung around outside until I saw Squarejaw pull up. I texted him asking if he liked my skirt. 
He said yes and that he thinks green is a good color for me. I asked him about my top and he said something about how I make pink and orange look good. I told him that I was going inside for a little bit so it would look like I'm doing normal teenager things, but that I wanted him to stay outside and watch over me. I went inside and quickly found somewhere to change outfits because nothing attracts attention like two girls wearing the same thing. Just as at the mall, I stayed only to have the phone near mini skirt a little longer, but I made sure to avoid her altogether. I did this two or three more times before moving on to phase three. This was the hardest part. The plan was simple. I needed to somehow convince Miniskirt that Kix was cheating on her with me. It wasn't that unlikely since we were the same age and in the same class before I was arrested, but I knew nothing about boys. I was always a loner and I just wanted to take care of myself. So I started having conversations on the phone around her for her to overhear when I knew she wasn't on the phone with sneakers. I was basically just saying things I heard some of the girls at the detention center say. They would say it when they wanted to get another girl's man. I was flirting with nobody on the other line. I'd say things like, she's too young for you, we used to be so good together. Just any kind of crap I could remember or think of. I did this a lot near the window to her room when I knew she was home. I never used his name, but I dropped details about the classes we were in and things that happened at the school while we were there. I didn't know if it was working or not, but eventually I had to put everything into the final stage. I had been promising Squarejaw that he would sleep over soon and to be ready to come over and protect me. I got rid of everything, all the clothes, the skimmer, everything other than the phone. I was ready. I waited for a day when she and her parents were home and Square Jaw was on duty. I texted him and told him I needed him to take care of something for me and he had to come immediately. The other girl said that's what they did so I was really hoping it would work. I then went to the window and called her out. When she stuck her head out, I told her that I've been seeing kicks and that she should just back off. I went inside and closed my window. I knew she had a temper so I went to my front door and waited for her. I wiped down the phone and put it on the table. As soon as she knocked, I opened and she hit me in the face and started screaming and swearing at me. I would received much worse from the Dean, but I also knew how to make it look good. So when she hit me, I made sure to also hit my mouth on the table. I smiled a bloody smile and told her to check my phone and see what kicks and I had been up to. She picked it up and started scrolling through it. Obviously, she was confused because all those texts were between me and Squarejaw. At that moment, her parents came in to see what was going on. That was my cue. I started crying, saying that she'd been bullying and robbing me, and that when I told her I'd call the cops, she said her boyfriend was a cop, and that she texted him to come sort me out. Her dad saw the phone in her hand, and she claimed it wasn't hers and that she was only holding it because I said I had texts with her boyfriend. He said he didn't believe her because he saw the charges on her credit card for a new phone. He took it from her and started scrolling through the messages. It was all there. Dates and times when she went to the mall, nights that she snuck out and the outfits she was wearing. Her mom immediately recognized the outfits as her daughter's. They read through a lot of the messages about how safe she felt with him and how even when she was small she needed him. Right around that time Square Jaw showed up. His first words were, baby, what happened? What happened next was not my intention and to this day I still regret it. Miniskirt's dad attacked Squarejaw. In hindsight, it was obvious why he would do that, but I didn't have a dad like that growing up, so I didn't see it coming. Squarejaw lived up to his name. He took it right on the chin and then beat the crap out of her dad and arrested him for assaulting a police officer. All I hoped for was her parents to accuse him of being a creep and threaten him so that he'd be too scared to come near me again, and for them to keep their daughter away from me. It took a couple of days for everything to be sorted out. Miniskirt's mom went to the press with the phone and the texts. The cop traced his phone and cruiser and matched it to the dates and times that Miniskirt was at those places. Miniskirt realized that she couldn't tell her parents that she snuck out with kicks because he was 19 and she was 16, because she actually loved him I guess. So she lied and said Squarejaw was her boyfriend. The cops let her dad go because they didn't want any more publicity and I think her family moved away after that. 
Squarejaw was arrested later, but he never said anything about me because I think he knew how it would look. The city didn't want to have any issues with me, so they reduced my probation and I was allowed to leave town sooner. All in all, I'm really sorry what happened to Miniskirt's dad and maybe them having to move away, but I'm more than glad I'm free of those two nightmares. P.S. I never stole again after that. Not even Wi-Fi. P.P.S. I'm a kindergarten teacher now. Let me start off by saying that when you're in trouble, even if you feel alone, please reach out and ask for help. OP clearly had a plan and it worked out, but that plan could have gone sideways and they could have suffered a lot more harm. Another takeaway I'd pull from this is basically that, while crime worked out for OP here, crime obviously doesn't pay. I know it's cliche to say, and oftentimes the temptation to use crime and revenge is near irresistible, but really I'd hope people could avoid relying on crime to solve difficulties. Should OP have reported the stalker police officer? If they even reported them, do you guys think the police would actually do anything about it considering they're a member of the force? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. But with that said, that's all the time we have for today. Now if you want to hear another revenge story that was crazier than the one in this video, click on that left video. Or if you missed my latest video, click on the right. But with that said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.